Hey so everybody, funny. welcome to the Shadowrun 6th Addiction, 6th, 6th Addiction. 6th uh, Addiction. That's, uh, I like that. Freudian, that's one more Freudian than five. Stuff. Yeah, that's right. It's our actual play showing off the 6th Edition rules for Shadowrun. Uh, my name's Bobby Frankenberger and I'm here with uh, four out of my other, or three out of, I can't count, three out of my other four cohorts in uh in in this uh, endeavor um we'll start with uh over there in the middle mr johnson how's it going mr johnson oh hello going pretty good i i just want to observe that like in one week's time some of you if you happen to be at a particular location in, in physical space will be able to buy the core book we've been working from in pdf more yes absolutely we're very very excited about that for other people to be able to get a hold of it and be able to let us know what they think about it. Um, so far, we've been sort of the way, and, and a couple of other uh, podcast uh, destinations, but um, in terms of live interactive analysis and everything, we've been the ones um, that we people have been checking out. Uh, because 6th edition Shadowrun, the full version, is going to be uh, available to purchase and everybody get their hands on and pages turned at Gen Con 2019 that starts uh, a week from well I mean I guess the official start day is a week from today uh, but but yeah so it'll be a week from today that people can start looking at it the other person here um, you all uh, who are f fans of Shadowrun extra media content um, probably have at least heard the voice of Opti the Crow Shamans of Neo Anarchist Podcast fame. Say hello, Opti. Hey, everybody. Glad to be here. Uh, if you didn't catch the earlier pre show, uh, I do have a podcast called the Neo Anarchist Podcast. Uh, actually, I actually have three, but that's irrelevant. Uh, but also been uh, branching out into doing some writing. So now I do freelance work for. Catalyst Game Labs, Shadowrun, uh, for FASA and their Earthdawn, and now Broomstick Fighters in their new Purgatory uh, game, and also just started my own gaming company a few months ago. We'll hopefully be hearing more about that soon. Very cool. And then uh, finally, well, sort of like the, uh, the penultimate final, like we're delaying the final introduction until Austin gets here, but uh, finally for now, uh, our good friend, Sarah Krause of Rem Attorneys Productions, who was just talking about her uh, Kickstarter campaign that I will not uh, flub up this time, and I'll just I'll just let Sarah talk about it so I don't say all the wrong things. Um, <laughs> Sarah, how's it going? It's going great. Um, we are almost almost two weeks in, um, so almost to the halfway point, and we are just four hundred and six dollars away from. Uh, also being at 50% funded. So we're in great shape. We're right on track for where we should be. If uh, you know you are interested in seeing a cyberpunk fantasy team series come to life, um, then uh, then check it out and uh, support. Back us if you can. We have some great prizes and rewards and stretch goals. And uh, yeah, so it's it's been a blast so far. It's been a lot of work to get here. It's exciting to get here. And uh, we've got some great people on our team, our creative team as well, including uh, some of these fine folks in this pretty box next to me. Um, yeah. So, yeah, Mr. Johnson is going to be uh, our composer. Um, and you can check out some of his music is already on the Kickstarter page uh, as Prism Shard. Um, and Opti is uh, one of our script writers and content writers. And Bobby's voice is all over our different videos that are on the page. So check it out and support all of us. And... Yes. Cut out for a second there. That's all right. I switched. Uh, I switched servers for a second because uh, there was some funniness with the voice. But I think that should. Hopefully that fixed it. Um, but it was only for a brief second that you cut out. So yes, I have, for one am excited to see some cyberpunk stuff up on uh, to to do that. We we as fans of the cyberpunk genre in the way that we are are always hungry for that kind of a thing and to see it sort of um, we have we have in our minds what it looks like right and for someone who's so close to the genre themselves in the same way that we enjoy it um, it's exciting to see uh, sort of what you're putting together and how it's taking form and how it's uh, how it's matching so well and I think that 
I think that we all want to see it happen. So you guys have a goal. We want to get this Kickstarter. I want to see this Kickstarter get to 50% funded by the, by the end of the night if we can manage. So I want you guys to go and check it out. The link has already been dropped in our chat twice. There's another one in there again. So go check it out. Um, do not feel bad if you have to mute us so that you can listen to the video there. It's okay. <laughs> We won't get you still get to hear it. Bobby's sultry voice. Yeah, I'm I'm in there too. So since since that's part of probably most of the reason you're here is to listen to me, never fear, I'm over <laughs> there too. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, check it out, and we'd love to see it get that far because um, it's uh, it's something that we're all excited to see happen. So um, yeah, I forgot too. Um, those that have backed by Gen Con, we're actually going to have uh, Rem Alterney's buttons uh, available and we're going to hand them out to anyone that's backed us. So that's going to be our Gen Con promotion. Um, so if you can throw anything our way, um, I'll be at the uh, Shadowrun room and the Shadowrun booth a bunch and I'll be getting some of our core players, the uh, core people involved, um, buttons to hand out too. So just show us that you backed and we'll, you'll get an exclusive Gen Con Kickstarter button. Nice, nice. I also want to mention too, like something you could do to support the Kickstarter if you don't if you don't have the funds laying around, is talk about it, share it, look for the tweets yeah. and retweet. Try to tell people about it who you think might be interested, and uh, yeah, just point them to it to, to check them out. Uh, I, I think uh, I think that's something that a lot of people just don't think of as much. I know when I when I look at a Kickstarter, I'm like, ah, I wish I could support this, and I don't have the money. A lot of times, it doesn't even occur to me to like, well, I could at least share it. Well, sometimes it does because um, I like to boost people's signal with my podcast stuff. But uh, so if it's like related to Shadowrun in some way that I think you know, think gamers might be up for, I do try to actively share it. But I just just on my own, that's not something I would normally think about. So uh, yeah, if you um, if you can't support it with money, you can totally help out by helping spread the word. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, yeah. guys. You're the best. <laughs> so. And if anybody knows anything about 3D printers, please hit me well, up. Bobby does. <laughs> He'll totally give you a hand. Oh, yeah, gosh. The show. <laughs> yeah. Tell, tell <laughs> me what's wrong. Matt Lemon can team up. Yeah. Tell me what's wrong, and I'll totally <laughs> figure it out. <laughs> all right we just got an update um okay austin says he'll be here eventually he's he's it's, don't count him out is what he said <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he, he will get here but we're gonna get started so um shatterun sixth edition uh mr johnson we are uh in your hands so why don't you take it away and tell us tell us what's going on and what you want us to do all right, well, here we are at the last episode of this campaign. Um, it's been a bit of a wild ride. You, you, you as runners showed up in Chicago to take on some jobs and make some money because it's uh, lots of opportunities in Chicago with the, the corpse gentrifying the, the, the craters. Um, <laughs> and you were hired to pull off a run and you happened to stumble upon some weird other information. And apparently, someone in Redmond a, who you actually found out was a um, a rigger by the name of Canyon it has acquired an old Ares suitcase nuke that apparently was supposed to have blown up along with Bug City back in the day, but it didn't. And then well, you found out, well, it's not that big of a deal because he needs an encryption key, right? Uh, but then you found out another job, supposed, seemingly unrelated, uh, that guy had the key, but he was killed while you were... Uh, trying to get uh he actually had a really clever way to get him out of there uh using doc wagon but not in the normal way um <laughs> but unfortunately doc wagon was killed as well as your target and apparently that oh i don't know if i gave that information well behind the scenes that person actually had the encryption key on them. no I, we did uh because um i think your fixer might have mentioned that he had the key on it now i'm losing track of which things you actually found out and which things i uh just had going on in my brain behind the scenes. There have been so many things with this campaign that have been going on behind the scenes that you guys just have not touched on. Yeah, we've sort of trampled over so many you can't keep them straight anymore. They're just like crumpled up pieces of paper strewn all over the floor. All right, so whether or not they know, like the, the actual like dude that they were supposed to recently extract and get had 
yeah, he was actually being gone after, not because he owed someone some money or something, but because Canyon knew that this dude had the key and he was trying to hide from him. So, so that's what happened. And then uh, you, you uh, went to go sort of turn in your job. The Johnson said he wanted the body back, uh, which he didn't really. He just wanted a, a ruse for you guys to show up. And uh, so him and his bodyguards could murder you. But then you murdered them in front of everyone hanging out at the diner at the truck stop. We well, are they, good at murder. They that's, kind of that's almost one of the things that we've been. <laughs> yeah. They kind of almost murdered. Uh. uh think, what didn't didn't Sarah's care? No, me. I'm dead. I, almost. I think Nen is is pretty good at getting murdered. And yeah. As well as murdering. Uh, Jin, didn't you have a a new, a new nickname for me, Mr. J? Uh, I think Chew Toy is probably <laughs> Denen's nickname after this. <laughs> <laughs> After Sad. all the hellhound run-ins and just generally getting chewed up by yeah. uh, but much anything that decides I, that it wants to send some damage her way. We certainly uh, didn't escape the, 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 the ambush unscathed by any means. I know my character, Rooster, is uh, in overflow right now, four boxes into overflow. So, Ouch. And uh, Denen's down too, isn't she? Yep. Uh, all this left is an injured uh, skipper and I think Jin, who took his assault rifle and just shot up what was left of the car. Yeah, weren't they, yeah. Weren't they trying to run thing. away? They are trying to yeah. run away. And there was like the one one guy who was like, didn't <laughs> actually try to kill anybody. He was like, let's get out of here and convince the other ones to run and picked up. Then Jin just made sure to come. And back. one of the so. disappointing <laughs> things is like, like Jin, when I, when I can see the character, this is a character that like I, I created a couple of years ago. He's been in a couple of different supplements, but he's not murderous like I've been playing him. I've been playing him so cutthroat in this game. <laughs> oh, right. Rooster losing a wing. How could we forget the, the way Rooster was Oh dropped. my gosh, you're right. <laughs> Mama Film and Whip got wrapped around his arm and basically like, you know, pulled all the meat off and then uh -huh. yanked it off at the elbow. Uh. That, that was lovely. Uh, yeah, it was gross. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think I'd blocked yeah. that out of my memory. Deliberately didn't write it into my notes. <laughs> yeah, that was a uh, that was nasty, nasty, nasty stuff. Um, but you survived, I think, uh, sort of. Uh, we're pretty much picking up with you guys, like right out in the parking lot, just picking up right where from we left off. So I know we're like showing off the game, and we're supposed to stick to the rules and everything exactly. But are you guys cool with just doing a little bit of hand waving? Always. Okay, yeah. so Skipper is busy behind the scenes while Jin is doing the murders. Uh, he's slapping some trauma patches on and doing some stuff with the med kid and gets really lucky or something. Dinan and Rooster, you end up stabilized and you're up with like one box away from getting filled in the physical track. So okay. you're conscious but really messed up. And yeah, Rooster, um, oh, you have like this stub. sort of sling. Uh... So. No, I, I think uh, maybe Skipper being a face, he'd be fairly sensitive to some of the, uh, you know, aspects of, uh, you don't want to be too jarring, right? He needs to get up and help. So yeah. he's like kind of patched up your arm and like kind of wrapped it up with a bandage around you, kind of held tight there. And so, sure. and, uh, and so you're not immediately aware that you're, that you have missing bits. So, oh, so okay. we'll then you, you, you wake up first and yeah, you're really savagely injured and just coming to consciousness and, uh, uh, Skipper, Skipper says, oh, "Just sit tight." And then you hear some, bah, some shooting and Jin screaming at the people or something. I don't know. Um, and then, yeah, then Bobby walk or th th then he walks over, and uh, a few moments later, Rooster, you're just coming too. Uh, by this point, Jin, you're just walking back. Well, I, I guess I'm assuming you're walking back. But uh, what did you do after? Like you just shot up with these people in the car, emptying the clip, and then like look over and see like in the window, there's a whole bunch of people gawking at you. Uh, I did a very quick reassessment of my life choices. Um, something in Chicago is causing me to uh, act in ways that I am not happy with. And uh, shooting people in front of other people is not my MO either. I'm much more comfortable hitting people and killing people in the Matrix. So I've decided that maybe it's time for me to uh, rethink my life and uh, go see what my teammates are doing. Or go see if they still right. You walk over and you see just as Skipper's doing his best to, he's basically like taping Rooster's, and he's like, here, hold him up. And you like kind of shoves Rooster up to a sitting position. He's still kind of unconscious. It just started to come to and, and uh, basically what you, you sort of props him up against you while he, he wraps the tape tightly around his torso. And there's a, it's kind of a tugging feeling and Rooster, you, you wake up with this uh, kind of like tape being tugged around your, your chest kind of tightly and, 
Uh, it hurts. Everything hurts, especially uh, your arm. Uh, uh, you don't uh, sound too well, my friend. Where is where is that fragging Johnson? I'm gonna... I I I roll over and go. It's pronounced. <laughs> I shot at him. Where is he? I reached for my gun, which I'm assuming in all of the moving around, I was probably stuff was taken off me to make things easier to. It's to yeah, it's kind up. of like lying almost tossed haphazardly yeah. on the ground a few feet away from where you're sitting. You kind of stumble to your feet and realize you you can't move your left arm. Uh, uh, it's taped to your chest. Yeah. Uh, uh, what? What happened? Where is he? Oh man. Uh, Skipper just kind of points, and you see that car, uh, maybe about five meters away from where you guys were. And yeah, it's just like all the windows are shot out. There's a few still forms in there, and just blood dripping out. Uh, you think you hear, you, you think you see the Johnson's feet kind of sticking out um, uh, one side. He was kind of tossed into the back before they, they ran for it. Oh, good. You got him. Jin, you got him, huh? I tried. I knew it was you. Right, I, I want knew you, guys you give could me do it. <laughs> audio perception test. Okay. So intuition plus perception. Uh, no edge involved here. Just a straight up roll. Unless you've got a special quality that would give it to you or something. By the way, new session. So don't forget your edges are refreshed to your a, a, a total equal to your edge value. Minus three for my damage. got one hit. Did you say audio or just... Yeah, hearing. Yep, audio. Yeah, I'm at a minus three, two, and I rolled a one. Par for Dinan's rolls. Okay, so you you first noticed the sounds of the uh, motorcycles. Um, about 30 seconds later, as you're sort of like gradually... I don't know, getting moving, I guess, and gathering up your things, getting ready to go. You um, you notice the uh, the motorcycles when their headlights point your direction and see, yeah, it sees looks like about a half a dozen ancients are rolling in on their green bikes, glowing, pulsing neon, and yet some of them look pretty familiar in a way that's not like, hey, I know that guy, but like, I've seen that person before in a way that fills me with dread. Oh my, friggin' ghost! This is not the time. <laughs> They, they sort of like move on past you and start circling this car and they're like all oh, really close like oh look at this fragger's dead all three of these hey i think i know this guy oh yeah he's dead uh did you see them they killed him hit that those guys that ran away skipper let's get the frag out of here they sort of uh turn by you guys one a uh, couple of the uh the uh bikes kind of come in your direction there's a um there's a uh, young looking elf with a really, really tall green mohawk on one of the bikes. And uh, on the other bike, there's uh, kind of an overweight elf uh, dude in the front and the uh, elf, elf uh, girl on the back who uh, looks like she's maybe 13, but she could be 50 for all you know, elves. Um, and uh, she's got these glowing tattoos all over her head. Uh, they're all green and they, they look pretty, uh, pretty uh i guess amused at this point they don't look like they're drawing guns or uh like looking to start a fight they're just like pull up near you guys and uh the girl in the back of the motorcycle like says oi chummers what's all this you see what happened not sure skipper uh yeah like, sort of... uh, somebody somebody shot them up real good and <laughs> the uh Look at the the kid with the pink or not the pink mohawk. The, the tall green mohawk on the other bike uh, kind of turns over, like points at your gun, like oh, uh, what are you doing? <laughs> Throw it behind my back. What? Uh, at um, hmm, uh, yeah, probably did. Time to go. I'm gonna reach for wherever my uh, my the nearest gun of mine to me and grab it just in case. It's like my security blanket. All right, uh, you realize that something is weird with your arm. Like, it, it's it's tied down, like, it hurts, but, like, something's... It doesn't feel right. You try go. wiggling your fingers, 
and it just feels like they're they're packed in a really tight glove, but it doesn't feel like they're taped in. Yeah, it's be in the back of your mind at the moment, but yeah. <laughs> oh god. Okay, Skipper, I'm not gonna do a real good job shooting with this arm taped up this way. I might need it free. Don't worry about it for now. I guess this should get the frag out of here. So in the background, the other four bikes, like they've gotten off. Most of them have gotten off of them. One sort of like pulled back and drawn his uh, drawn his Uzi, just kind of hanging out like in the parking lot watching, like occasionally staring at the people inside the, the diner and giving them a leer and waving his gun around uh, just to kind of give the motion like, hey, we're claiming this spot. And then the other three gangers start pulling out bodies and going through pockets and looting the, uh, the people you just killed. So uh, you're saying maybe you killed them, maybe you didn't, but you don't care about their stuff? Not right now. Uh, wait, unless there's some good stuff. How about um, I go look at it real quick, and if there's anything I don't want, you can have it. All right. There might be uh, some specific non-monetarily uh, important stuff on there that we'd love to get to take a look at, but um, you can have anything of value. How about that? We sort of look at each other and shrug, and uh, the... Uh... The guy who's in the front of the, the kind of overweight elf uh, toward, toward the front sort of lifts up his goggles and gives you a bit of that. All right, head on over there. And he, he gets off his bike and uh, uh, so do the other ones. They just kind of leave him parked there for the moment and uh, I'll lead you on over back to the scene of the carnage. All right, well, a real quick look around and see if the there's anything good. No, I'll, you know, I'll follow along, but I'll stand back a little bit kind of between them and the van so that we can... GTFO if we need. Yeah, Rooster's just sitting in the back and uh, has has propped his uh, his Desert Strike up on the windowsill, kind of like as best as he can surveying the situation, but he's really kind of useless right now. And also at this time, you're starting to hear distant sirens. That's our cue, Jin. Let's make it quick. Yeah, I'll All start right, heading back to you. Do my looks. Okay, you start looking them over. Give me a perception test. And uh, did you say you were looking them over too, Sarah? No, I'm I'm keeping an eye on on Jim, but I'm back in my way to the van. Herg, I got zero hits. You just look them over, and you just can see them there, like lots of holes in them, blood all over the place. Uh, maybe you just don't want to look at him too closely or something, because uh, you just don't seem to pick up anything that you think you might want. Yeah, nothing here. All right, let's go. Yep. I feel so, like it's going to come back and kick us later, but... You uh, you start walking back to the uh, the, the truck, and then you realize the sirens are getting a lot louder, and you can see on the... Uh, so basically, this truck stop is kind of on the frontage road near an exit, and there's this big old probably six lane by this point highway that goes by and so on that highway on the southbound lane you see what looks like three cop cars lights blaring going full speed zooming to the south they're they're not too far from getting to the exit that will then take them to this location which you might assume that they're headed to um yep skipper let's 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 do the thing all right all right, Skipper uh, takes a seat in there, fires up the truck, and uh, I guess uh, backs up. And gosh, it would be kind of nice to have him make some sort of a role here to see how, whether or not he draws attention from it, the police it, or not. It would have yeah. So, so as he's doing this, it looks like the the ancients have, have kind of finished uh, finished with their with their initial looting. Uh, one of them managed to pop the trunk open with like with a uh, pry bar and. They pulled a few things out of there, and uh, one of them, uh, the the uh, the the girl who was on the back of that other bike who talked to you before with the glowing tattoos on her head, um, she leans over. Um, oh, what was her name? Um, the troll. Crap, forgetting my NPCs. I don't have the notes in front of me. Oh, Lola. Yes, the troll with the monofilament whip. She sort of leans over and. Uh, um, Takes out, takes out a big old combat knife and starts sawing at her neck. Oh, cuts her head oh. off. Stuffs it in a, like a satchel. It's a, Jeez. This is gruesome. 
And uh, they start hopping on their bikes. It looks like they're still kind of taking their time a little bit. The, the cops are starting to get a little bit closer and and uh, Skipper's already starting to uh, pull out of the parking lot a little bit. He's, he's going around the far side where a lot of the semis park and killing the lights and kind of moving in between some of the parked semis and hoping he can kind of slip away that way. So it's a little bit slower. I would like one of you to roll the stealth check for me. Uh, you may, because we don't have Skipper's stats in front of us, uh, we'll have one of you roll your own stealth skill. Uh, maybe you're a backseat driver, maybe we're just uh, abstracting this, whatever. Uh, but use your own stealth skill uh, to determine. All right, I got this. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna go with not it. I am yeah. injured, but I do have an urban stealth specialization. How about zero hits? Oh my, that's that was nearly a, a critical glitch. glitch. Yeah. Okay, so you're sort of moving through. It's dark. The lights are killed. You're sort of pulling in between these these semi trailers and slowing down a bit. You hear the cop cars roaring and they're speeding around, and it seems like they're splitting up to kind of surround and move around the place and get an idea of like where things are, what's going on. So like, there's no one way someone could easily slip through. And uh, Austin's like, hold up a sec, and then Jin, uh, you uh, no, uh, that's not. That'd be more glitch. So yeah, I guess um. Skipper's moving around, and Jin, you're like, oh, look out for that one over there, and this cop car zooms by, and I'm like, ah, oh, we're good. And he pulls out, and then there just happens to be another cop car coming the other direction, that, like, almost runs into him. So, uh, they've got their lights on, and uh, I guess we're going to be on initiative here. Can I? Oh, okay. I'm not going to use any of the fancy car chase rules, because um, we don't have a rigor here, and I, you know, I I would, a lot of that... Uh, yeah. Kind of be behind the scenes, I guess. We'll we'll do what what I often do sometimes in a role playing game, where like we're missing one of the elements of the group. Uh, something has to happen uh, in the story that might not be covered. So you have some sort of an NPC or a player character in the background, and you can sort of um you don't have to completely hand wave away with the rules of what what's going on, but you may narrate sort of the things that are happening and kind of guide how well things go on that front based on some of the influence of the actions of the other players. It's a little bit more of an improv narrative uh, style of doing things, and it doesn't always fit well in a more uh, crunchy game like Shadowrun, but but I, I've used it before fairly frequently, most often for Deckers, actually, uh, in older editions. <laughs> but uh, in this case, we'll use it for, for the, uh, the car chase side of things, or Is whatever it it's going to be. Is it too late? Is it too late? I was going to summon a spirit, or are we now officially an in initiative? Hmm. I will allow you to summon a spirit. You would uh. have had plenty of time to do it. I would generally prefer that you had mentioned it before I say real initiative, but you know, you don't know when I'm going to say that. So. All right, be right back. And I need to be ready to, so I'll be right back. All right, and I'll figure out my role here. So I am doing. My conjuring is four plus my magic is six. So 10 minus my <laughs> three dice. And we're gonna, yeah, uh, we're gonna do a force four. That probably won't kill me. Two pull hits. Gosh, guys, we can't roll. Yeah, we're doing a bad time today. Uh, what are your initiatives again? Would you mind calling them off? Looks like Opti had an 11, and I have a 22. I have a 9. Finally rolled well. Man, aren't you glad these aren't multiple passes? <laughs> uh, otherwise, Rooster would go three times, and Rem would have to sit through most of those. And there's nothing else to do. Not Rem. I'm missing Rem. It's Rem Alternatives. I should use it. <laughs> Then yes, I, I wrote <laughs> Rem down for some reason. Well, I know what reason. But, oh my brain! It's okay. That is me. <laughs> All right, so we have Rooster on twenty-two. You're definitely first. So the car kind of pulls out, and you see this copper. It has to hit the brakes and swerve a bit to avoid ramming you guys. It wasn't expecting you to pull out there, and yeah, you know, that cop is definitely going to be wondering what you're doing. So what do you want to do about it? Oh boy. Um. Oh, here's an interesting idea. Okay. Um, oh, man. How could I do this? Uh, 
Does um Do we think uh do we think Skipper has any like duct tape anywhere nearby? Uh, let's say sure. <laughs> I have the idea It seems like something you'd likely have, right? Yeah, I have the idea of causing the effect of a smoke grenade, um, but but by uh, activating the smoke grenade and like attaching it to the side of the truck so that the smoke trails behind us. Okay. Well, I guess uh, first you'll have to find some duct tape. All right. Well, I'll look for some duct tape. <laughs> All right, um, we'll just call that a minor action. It's not so much a full observing detail, but you, you take a look around and uh, duct tape and Rooster's like, here, and tosses some back for me that he pulls out of the glove box and you, you have duct tape in your hands for minor action. So would you call and, it uh, Would you call it a, a major action to prepare my smoke grenade to the to be a t to attach it to the side of the truck? Um, let's call it a major and a minor. Okay. A major action to kind of like a do the actual taping process and a minor action to roll down the window and I don't know. And slap it on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so you're out one major and two minor. Uh, so anything else? I'll hold um, any the two remaining minor actions that I have and I'll wait to do this. I've prepped my I've prepped my uh, my James Bond smoke screen. <laughs> have you activated the smoke grenade? I have not activated it yet. If I if I'm ca if I'm capable of activating it within this turn, then I want to. But I thought maybe it wouldn't be until next turn. Uh, yeah, you could activate it right away as part of your actions if you want, or yeah. wait till later and spend a minor action to click the button or whatever. Then I'll do that. I'm like, I'm doing this. <laughs> Slapped it on the side, and you know, pulled the virtual pin, and so there's smoke spraying behind us now. Okay, uh, so smoke whooshes out, and the car is actually going pretty slow. So a lot of it, a lot of it ends up going right back into the cab, uh, causing you guys to start hacking and coughing a bit. <laughs> uh, unless you have a respirator <laughs> on, I suppose. <laughs> but most of it's actually outside, and it's actually like nobody out there can see a damn thing right now. Uh, you have a—is that a thermal smoke grenade or a regular one? Um, it's a regular smoke grenade. And in Shadowrun, you've got two options for those. Thermal smoke grenades have particles that. I guess absorb or emit heat, mm -hmm. uh, so they also throw off thermal vision. Right, and I don't. I deliberately don't because I want to be able to use my thermal vision to see through it. So. Yeah, that's a nice combo. Yeah. Uh, well, we're gonna move on to. Let's see. The cops go on fifteen. Uh, they go woo woo, and um, they're kind of pulling up some to kind of pull up near near the vehicle and kind of rolling along. They haven't actually stopped, but like uh, one of the uh, out of the intercom system on the car says this is Lone Star please pull over immediately we will assist you with your fire leave the vehicle but lay on the ground with your hands over your head nice <laughs> that went better than I expected <laughs> so next is Jin's turn so yeah it looks like they're like falling for some kind of a ruse but uh, they still want you to stop I don't what know if it's do? if it's an accident. Can you really call it a ruse? I was not intending to deceive them in the least. <laughs> oh really? <laughs> I just uh, wanted there to be a smoke screen so I could shoot like, through it if I need to. <laughs> uh, you just open up the window and a bunch of smoke pours out and behind the car and stuff. <laughs> I, I figured that's what the cops would assume initially, but yeah. <laughs> uh, opening up a window with smoke coming out is not normally what the cops assume. Uh, just FYI, but. <laughs> We will, uh, I will, I'm going to see if they are actively, uh, matrix available. By, um, so minor action matrix perception test. That's, That's complete three. Intuition. Three hits. Yeah, you, you, first of all, you definitely see the big glaring angry red lone star notice in AR telling you guys to like, you know, get out and get down and stuff. Uh, but then you also see the car itself is wirelessly active, connected to Lone Star's computer system with its sensor suite. Uh, they've got a couple of uh, drones on standby in the trunk, um, uh, like surveillance-type drones, not combat ones. And uh, they've, they've each got comm links uh, and some guns and stuff. Uh, let's see, do they have cyberware? Yeah, 
I'm gonna say, uh, where is this? Sorry, I don't have actually have stats for the cops, so I'm gonna pull them up, pull up the ones that we already have made up for us in the Shadowrun book. But I don't actually have this PDF open for the Shadowrun book, so somebody stall for a minute, say something interesting. Well, I know what I'm gonna do. Anyway, uh, like, I, am, I am going to use control device on one of the drones uh, to turn it on and start banging it up against the uh, the trunk of the car so that they don't know what the heck is going on in their trunk and maybe leave us alone. All right, let's get the matrix section printed out. <laughs> uh, so we're looking at control device here. That is a uh, into or uh, not intuition, but uh, electronics plus logic. But I get an extra edge because it's a logic test. Yep. Uh, I'm just trying to see. I guess I don't have the matrix actions printed off in front of me anymore. All right. Um. Oh, it's uh, it's versus willpower and firewall. And what's the access level required? Uh, user or admin can vary. With okay, action. so you'll, you'll have to get user access at least in order to give commands to the drones ah, or I admin. See. So. Well, this will be this will be okay. So I will go ahead and do uh, brute force since it's, uh, they don't see me and they're not really plugged into the drones. They're not really using them at the moment. So uh, right. I think brute force is, uh, is appropriate. So this would, would uh, be my hacking specialty. Cracking plus logic with your hacking specialty because brute force and backdoor entry as well as probe are all hacking actions. Uh, and this is willpower plus firewall for them. And this will get me an edge. Yo, that's not great. Um, how about I spend four edge and reroll them? Uh, how many have you got? Edge? Successes. I didn't see your roll here. Uh, that was one. Sweet. Okay. Yeah, you probably want to edge that. <laughs> All right. That's uh, four more, so that's five. All right. Yeah, I rolled like crap, so but still well enough to defeat your initial roll. But with that, that edge roll, you, you push that through. And uh, how does your brute force action look? Uh, or how would it look if someone was observing you in the Matrix? Uh, my uh, icon is a purple and blue genie um and so i throw these sort of uh not purple and blue purple and red i throw these purple and red tornadoes that uh, spin around and attack and one of them just uh creates a little hole in their defense all right you see the hole is there uh you're also reasonably certain your overwatch st overwatch score is going to start going up uh, fairly rapidly just over the course of a few minutes of course you know, you shouldn't need that long anyway. But um, the other thing is, is that one of those police officers has almost certainly gotten some sort of alert that they are under a hacking attack. They won't know from where or by whom or what's being hacked, but they know something, some sort of illegal access was just forced on the device. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay with that. I figured. Yeah. I just want to make sure to point that out because it's an important distinction in how this works and how it works in the system. Right. And uh, why you might want to take a whole minute to set up your probe so you can do your backdoor entry instead at certain other occasions, but also given the circumstances, why that's not going to work. Cause you <laughs> just don't have time for that. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I right. think that'll, that'll be my turn. Sounds good. And then we move on to Divan's turn. Yeah. So, um, I rolled a two on summoning a force, uh, four spirit. If you would mind, and that was before initiative, but we need to catch up on that. The spirit has arrived at your call. Uh, you have one net hit, and you're looking at only two drain to resist. It would be one, but because they only rolled one hit, but it, the minimum's two. Okay. I'm fine. Um, so I'm going to go ahead, and that was a spirit of water, by the way. So um, I'm going to use a minor action uh, to um, command it to use movement on the car. Um, right. so that we can make our escape. And I'm also, just in case, going to summon another Force 4 Spirit. Right, when, you summon uh, and the, I'm... when you summon the Force 4 Water Spirit, I'll say it's a gas station truck stop thing. Okay, so it's a... Um, it's a... Uh, it appears in astral space like a kind of a... 
giant, well, not giant in sort of relative sense, but it looks like it's a big old plastic see-through water bottle with arms and legs and a smiley face. Uh, but it also looks like <laughs> it, it was like designed by someone who was described what bottled water bottles look like, but never actually saw one. There's like subtle weird details that seem off. Like, like the top is like kind of an open lip and there's water that occasionally sloshes out. It doesn't look like it's threaded or something for the cap or, you know, whatever thingies they put on water bottles. But yeah, you have, you have a um, you have a force four water spirit, and cool. now and in the combat you're summoning a, another spirit. I believe so because the car's moving, right? We are moving very slowly Skipper at this point. Driving. It seems like Skipper's about to do something. Okay, um, then yeah, I'm gonna summon another one just to be safe. Um, using my major action. major action, and I'm gonna use my reagents again. So I get an, I'm now at five edge, which is so exciting for me. I rolled four hits on that. All right, you have two net hits, and you're looking at two drain to resist. Um, if you have any minor actions left, it does take a minor action to issue commands to your spirits, otherwise they hang out in astral space. And I'm sorry, what kind of spirit is this one? Um, we're going to do this one a spirit of Earth. Um, I am not having it do anything with us, though, at this time. All right. Um, hmm, spirit of Earth at a gas station. What should that be? Do you take um, a stun on that? That will say this spirit in astral space uh, appears to be uh, like almost like a humanoid rough, a rough guesstimation of a humanoid form, but it's made of like chunks of broken asphalt and concrete. Cool beans. I do have one more minor action. Am I able to use that to stim patch myself? Uh, let's see. I think it would take you at least you at least a minor action to get a stim patch out, if not a major action, depending on where we'll you have it. We'll, we'll say minor action because you'll probably have it in an accessible pocket, right? Um, sure. So it'll be a minor action to slap it on next turn. And it is now next turn. So uh, first off, we're going to have Skipper go. He, uh, he kind of looks back at you guys as if, like, are we staying or running? <laughs> And I think uh, Dinen probably gives him some sort of gesture, like, why the fuck aren't you driving away yet? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> he, uh, he hits he hits the gas, but he does it in such a way that, it, like, it, the car, like, kind of jerks forward and back and jerks forward and back and kind of turns and this. That. It seems like something's wrong. You look over at him, he's got this little bit of a smile on his face. Um, so he's driving a bit erratically, both to kind of help spread the smoke screen out a little bit, uh, but also to make it seem like the car is malfunctioning some, to maybe buy you a little bit more time. But he is getting away a little faster. Okay. And he's like, if you guys are going to do anything else, uh, any sort of parting gifts, uh, let me know, because uh, I'm going to put this, uh, rather, I'm going to I'm gonna put the accelerator, I'll, I'll, I'm going to put the acceleration up to 100% in about three seconds. Gosh, I can't talk today. What? <laughs> I can't wait till Skipper's here to talk for himself. <laughs> right, and then at that point, it is Jin's turn. No, Rooster's turn. I'm going to delay. I want to see what, what Jin's going to do. I'll, t I'll, All take, right. I'll take aim through the... I don't have anything to aim at, so never mind. <laughs> All right, then the cops get to go. See, one of them is fiddling with this comm link to try to figure out what, what's happening. Uh, maybe calling in some Decker support or something. The other one... Uh, here we go. The other one is going to... is going to lean out of his vehicle and uh, point his Colt America L36 in your general direction and squeeze off some warning shots. By that, I mean he's trying to hit you with bullets. So let's see. Uh, I'm gonna shoot at Rooster because that's kind of an open window, and he saw like someone sticking their arm out there. So that's the closest thing he's got for target Rooster. Um, I know you didn't specifically take cover, but I'm gonna give you cover four on this. Okay. Uh, didn't pull. they just so got... tell us to pull over? Yeah. And you're driving away somewhat erratically. Now they're giving you warning shots by shooting you. So. All right. <laughs> so. So yeah, this, this this officer squeezes off a few rounds in a semi-auto burst, and yes, yeah, so you've got cover four, which means you have plus four to your defense rating and a plus four dice on your defense test. 
I'm also going to give you a situational bonus edge because of the smoke. So lots right. of bonuses for you there. And then uh, he gets to shoot. Mm -hmm. Well, my defense rating, you want that from me just for... Yeah, we should compare those here. I, I got a, an attack rating of 8. So I think you're probably going to end up with an edge on this, on that too. Yeah, with I mean, a... So do I take... This is straight. I don't have any like wound modifiers for defense rating comparisons, do I? Not for the DR. Well, for your actual like dice pool for yeah. your defense test, you will suffer penalties on that. Right. But the actual defense rating, that's your body plus armor, you know, modified by any other oddball stuff like right. being in cover. Right. So while I'm doing that, um, for the benefit of those who may be tuning in for the first time in combat for Shadowrun, the f one of the first steps is for 6th edition is to compare the attacker's attack rating to the defender's defense rating. And whoever, if someone has on either side has four or more than the other person, then, then the one who has that big advantage gets a gets an edge. Um, so I have body of five plus full armor, five as 10 plus the helmet is 12 plus so 16. So I've got, so that gives me an, another, another edge because you said he has eight, right? Yep. Right. So you have four or more uh, than he does. So you get the edge. So. Now you gain two edge. That's the most that you can get in a single combat round. So keep it in mind for when right. you shoot later or something. Okay. And you roll your reaction plus intuition minus three for your wounds, but plus four for the cover. And I believe you had actions held, so you could still do a dodge if you wanted as well. Yeah, might as well do a dodge. So with that, you spend a minor action. It allows you to add a number of rank, a number of dice to your defense test equal to your ranks in the athletics skill. All right, I've got. It's four. one of my favorite parts of the new rules, actually, is the like minor minor action defense things. So this I is really like... to to add all these dice up. I've got a reaction five, intuition four, so that's nine. So then I would also have the plus four from cover four, that would be thirteen, plus my athletics rank is four, so that gives me seventeen minus three from my damage, so I'm at fourteen dice from my defense rating. Four hits. Yeah, and I'm going to have this cop take and use one of his actions to aim. So that gives him an extra die. Oh, what a crap roll. I got two hits. So, yeah, bullets essentially spang and ricochet off of the off of the, the truck. And Skipper's like, God damn it, I just got that thing fixed. Instinctively, I, you know, ducked and dodged. Yeah, there's, there's one that sort of like goes through the car and yeah. punches a little hole in the opposite window. It'll start spider web webbing out later. <laughs> then, um, let's see. Now it is Rooster's turn. No. Jin's turn. Jin is an 11. All right. So now I'm going to control device. And I'm going to set off one of those drones to just create a little bit of havoc in the back seat. If there are any weapons, I'll fire them. But you said they were just sort of lucky drones. Yeah, it's a little bit more rugged uh, version of a fly spy, but uh, not much. They don't stop showing any weapon systems. It's a um... Lord. Why can't I roll tonight? Uh, just one. Do you think that's going to be good enough? You want to re-roll anything? No, I just spent four edge. Um, I sh we should mention you're doing an edge action here. Are you doing an action, um, a logic-based test? So you got an edge for that. Which we should have done that. Um, also, oh, so I guess I got two more than I started with, so I guess. Yeah. Also, though, whenever you're doing a matrix action, um, you compare your attack rating to the defense rating of your target. Your attack rating is your attack plus sleaze. The defense rating is the data processing plus firewall of your target. So uh, what is what is your decking attack rating? My decking attack rating is very, very... Uh, eight. Eight. Uh, that's not quite good enough to get you an edge just for that, then. So you got one edge for your uh, analytical mind. But I reduced the defense rating of my hacking target by two because of my exploit program. Oh, in that case, you do get an edge. Yeah, you were like three above. Solid. 
Uh, so does that mean I get uh, an edge for both of those ones? One last round in this round? Um, I don't remember if you got two edge total last round or not. I did not. Yes. Okay, so yeah, uh, add a total of three edge to your current total then. Because deckers rack up edge pretty fast. <laughs> All right, so I'm back at four. So I guess that that I guess I could go ahead and make another reroll. So let's do that. Uh, that'll be a total of four. Oh, that's just good enough. So. You get the command in to tell the drone to start launching and bumping into Drek or something? Or yeah, it's actually just like flying uh, back and forth in the trunk and just creating as much havoc as possible. Okay, so the drone launches and starts bumping around in there, causing a little bit of chaos in the trunk. And then we move on to Denen's turn. All right, so I have um, the spirit moving me, moving the van faster now, right, for our getaway? Uh Hold on a sec. You ordered one of the spirits to do that, so it would be it would have materialized, and then it would have to use its own power to do that. I have to look up how the movement power works on vehicles. Cool. So the critter, the wildlife section of the core book is where the critters and the NPCs are. That's also where you'll find the critter powers, uh, just like how the fifth edition book is laid out in that respect, actually. Uh, it cool. allows the critter to speed up or slow down the target's movement rate. It only uh, works on things that are predisposed to locomotion, like vehicles, characters, and critters. Yeah, Using so normally, on vehicles... if you use it oh, on sorry, people, it just increases their speed pretty easily. But if you use it on a vehicle, it's harder. The The spirit has to roll their magic plus willpower. It's probably double force, unless there's a slightly different willpower calculation for the spirit you picked. But they roll magic plus willpower with a threshold of half the vehicle's body, which is going to be a threshold of six. Force wow. eight spirit is going to have to roll really well to get that movement power to work. That's, yeah, that's rough. So I guess mm. go ahead and roll um, eight dice and uh, see if that goes up. Two hits. Uh, make the, the impression you get from the spirit as it looks at this like blob of technology you're sitting and you're trying to tell, make it move faster. It's like, make it's this big what move faster. The, you're you're sitting down. How am I supposed to do that? <laughs> it Aww. seems like your spirit is confused. Um, <laughs> confused spirit is cute spirit. I don't think we've used any reactions yet. We're still kind of resolving the retcon, so to speak. So, uh, what else right, are you doing um, this turn? Round, I should say. Is is it's it the same rules for for concealment then? We see. Looking at concealment. Let's see here. Concealment can be used simultaneously on a number of average metahuman sized targets. Body less than five. Body over five counts as two targets. <clears throat> um, equal to the critter's magic or number of blah 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 um, so yeah it could conceal the uh, the truck so let's see how's this, how's this gonna work in combat has, they have to make an observe and detail major action to do a perception test to overcome the concealment I'm You're totally surprised. imagining right now like the, the magician drops the smoke bomb and they're no longer there I want to do that with the van <laughs> normally I'd say like Concealment probably wouldn't work on something that like your opponent is already seeing and tracking and in action with, but having that smoke screen there, I think maybe just gives the spirit just just enough. So, is this your earth spirit or the water spirit that's doing the concealment? Uh, this is the water spirit. I'm changing direction. All right, yeah. So the water spirit like materializes inside the back seat right next to Rooster, splashing water around, and uh, sort of holds its sticks its hands out on either side, like one to one door, one to the other, and goes Eeeh! And the, uh, the, the the van begins to fill with smoke. Uh, but then you realize you're not coughing, because it's not real smoke. And then it sort of flows over things, and everything sort of has this translucent, transparent look to it. There's oh. also a water poop on 
on uh, Skipper's seat now. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, concealment it's more applies. more sloshing out of its head. Yeah. <laughs> Concealment applies oh, the go improved invisible status to uh, equal to the critter's magic attribute. So that's four. Okay, so... So so for my uh, minor action, then, I'm going to slap the stim patch on. Okay, you slap the stim patch on, it will take effect at the end of the round, which is basically when you say you're done with your turn. Except Rooster might cool. do something, I guess. How many boxes does that of stun does that help? Uh, well, it depends on what rating the rating the stim patch is. Rating six. Then six boxes. Cool. Okay. Feeling better, even though I'm bleeding still. Um, so, oh, those uh, lovely stims. Yeah, I am gonna hold action um, for my major now. Um. Okay. Fair and enough, though, just, you're just going to lose it because of the end of the round. Just in time, we are joined by hey. our face rigger. Welcome. Just in Welcome time. Join us. Oh, man. You're glad to be here. What am I? What did I miss? Uh, uh, someone everything. shot your car. You missed all the important <laughs> parts. You were, you were not here to make any terrible decisions. Mr. Johnson made the decisions for you, and we just became invisible. No, I'm just... <laughs> You're trying to drive away from the cops at this gas station. You tried to sneak, but they spotted you because uh, yeah, yeah. somebody rolled really badly on your behalf on a stealth roll. And um, yeah, the cops were shooting. They were actually shooting at roosters. So the actual, like, hitting your vehicle was just sort of narrative damage, like a hole through one of your windows. Yeah. And Well, not narrative to you, of course, but no actual damage boxes. Um, yeah, we need you to um, roll better than any of us have been. Yeah. We're currently trailing a bunch of smoke because Rooster taped a smoke grenade, uh, duct taped a, a smoke grenade to the outside and set it off. Uh, and now it's, now it's concealed. There's cops behind you who've been sort of shooting at you. Jin's doing some hacking stuff, and it's actually your turn now. I'm um, going to go ahead and use my saved action to knock the, since, since I assume I can, we're invisible now, right? Well, yeah, you it's kind of, I mean, you can sort of see yourself, but it, you, when you look at your hand, it seems like it's like coming apart in smoke, but then when you like tighten it or something, it, it goes back into resolution some. It's weird. All right, I'm going to uh, use, I'm going to use my, the butt of my assault rifle to, uh, to knock that smoke grenade off of, onto, the, onto the street now so that it doesn't somehow accidentally uh -huh. give us away. I'm gonna call that a major action because yeah, it's yeah. duct tape. That's fine. Here's I don't plan on shooting or doing any combat because I don't want to give Actually, us away. Wait a minute. It's duct tape. Uh, give me an agility test. <laughs> just, just double your agility dice. Uh, and or the double your agility attribute in dice. We'll call this a threshold of three. If you fail, oh no, the duct tape smoke grenade gets stuck to your rifle butt. <laughs> <laughs> That's Holy duct tape. shite. Um, I might need to pre-edge this. <laughs> Three no. is too much, right? Let's go with two. All right. I think the is going for a TPK here. <laughs> All right. I won't pre-edge this. We'll see what happens. Nine. Okay, that's nine with my damage modifiers. Oh, three hits. I would have gotten it anyway. Oh, you got it anyway. Yeah. So you hit it, hit it, and like it falls off, and like there's a little corner of it that's stuck to the the butt of your rifle. Well, you're expecting that, so you get a little extra wiggle, and it falls off, and and keep spitting smoke off of the ground. You, yeah. you can't kind of happen to notice that there's this like dark scorch mark in the electrochromic paint job of the that door of the car of the truck. And I say with <laughs> a free action. I, yeah, with a free action, I say, "All right, Skipper, no time like the present. Let's take advantage of this moment." And uh, it's your turn uh, again. Just to set the scene, you were you were in this uh, truck stop right where Jin walked up and killed a bunch of people. A bunch of including ancients, including our Johnson, up. remember? Yeah. A bunch of ancients, ancients showed up. Like some of them, ones that like shot up your truck before, but they didn't recognize you. Uh, they chatted for a while. They looted the bodies. I uh, had a bit of a conversation, and the cops started showing up. And there's three cop cars sort of like circling around. And you decided to try to get out of there, and so you were trying to be sneaky. I'm picturing like a truck stop with like lots of semi trailers parked, so you killed lights and kind of slipped through between some of them. Uh, but again, because dice hate you, uh, um, when you popped out of there, there was a cop car that just happened to be coming and spotted you and wondered what the hell you're doing there. And you're trying to avoid the conversation to explain why. 
yeah. because it's totally not what I mean. It's totally their business to know. Yeah, and that's when I popped the smoke grenade onto the side of Van and Danin, uh got her spirit to cast concealment or to use con the concealment power on us, and that's why the whole vehicle is invisible. You're caught up now. Go. All right. Now face face with the cop. <laughs> Sorry, what's that? So I'm face to face with this cop right now, talking to him. No, no, you're in your truck trying to drive away from this cop car with a smoke grenade on the ground between you and them, and hopefully you're invisible now. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's exactly where I want to be. Uh, let's gun it as hard as we can. Yeah, face to face with the cops is what you're trying to avoid at all costs at this point, I think. Because, you know, you just did a bunch of murders that, like, a couple dozen people saw. <laughs> you don't know that well, yet. One of your party members, at least. Not necessarily you. I mean, you did some murder, I think. Weren't you the one who off the Johnson? Or at least dropped him? I ran over someone with the truck. I think that was Bebop. No, no, Bebop got in the car and uh, got shot up. I think it was Lola with the filament whip. Oh, yeah. It was Lola. All right, so um, I'm going to go ahead and roll a uh, driving check, a piloting. All right, and what are you trying to do with that? Like, get the hell out of there, or something else? Pretty much, yeah. I'm gonna pull. I'm gonna pull some Fast and the Furious maneuvers and uh, get out of there as fast as possible. I don't care how loud it is. All right. Looks like five hits. All right, yeah. So you accelerate just boom, and like there's. Uh, in the back, you hear this weird voice says, Whoa! and you look back and there's this like bottle of water, like somewhat humanoid bottle of water sitting in the middle with his hands on either side. It's just like water is sloshing out the top of the bottle, like out the back into, your, into the back of your truck and out the back window. <laughs> and if we had other summoners, I know that's Denens. Yep. And yeah, with that, you, you zoom a good chunk away. It does make some noise, though, so the cops on their turn... Well, it's Jin's turn next, actually. Uh, you've got the drone doing what you want it to do. Probably uh, that... won't be much of a distraction just now, but it, it, it's certainly going to mess with things. Uh, that's what I was wondering, if it was having any effect. Well, it's bouncing around inside the trunk. Uh, they might be going, wow, what the hell is that noise in the trunk? But they're also involved in, like, you know, trying to tell people to stop moving while they shoot at them, so. Sure. Um, well, I don't think I can do anything else like that uh, with, well, I don't think I can do anything else with this drone, so that, that's kind of a bust. So, instead, I'm going to do a brute force and try to hack into the car's matrix. Uh, the uh, car as a device. The car is slaved to the same thing the drone is, so you actually have user access through brute force already on this system. Ah, okay. That's kind of a pan thing, uh, so. I'm yeah, not 100% yeah, yeah, yeah. sure that's how the rules are supposed to work, but it makes sense. I'm gonna go with it. Uh, so what if I did a well I can already do a data spike I want to maybe like I want to send like an uh, like an APB to a different part of the city they, so that like well, do, do, you, do you know does your character have knowledge of how cops do things no okay uh you know I'll, I'll give you this one for free like they're showing up to a murder scene where there's automatic weapons fire like, there's nothing more important than where they are right now. So it's you're not likely to, like, steer them away from that. Like, uh, I've seen happen in other cases where, like, you're not in a combat situation or it's not as clear. All right. Well, then I will just do data spike and try to crash their car. Not crash it, but, like, shut it down, you know? Yep. A data spike is a straight up hit thing. Cracking and, and logic. Yeah. Versus data processing and firewall. Right. Um, we're dealing with the same uh, matrix attributes here, or attack rating versus defense rating. So as long as you're still running exploit, you get an edge for that. And you get an edge because of analytical mind and it being a logic-based test. So that's your two edges that you can gain for this round. Uh, 
That's two. Two hits, baby. Eh, I'm gonna spend an edge to. Uh, can I spend two edge to reroll two? Yes. Ah, waste. All right, so two hits. You fail. Ah, well. Trying to figure out what the consequences of this failure should be. I'm not going to take the time to look it up. We'll just move on. Uh, are there normally you do anything with your other actions? Uh, like alarms would be set off, and you kind of brute force your way in already, and it's not terribly relevant for them to like get more information. These cops aren't like Decker types necessarily. Yeah, so, all right. It happens. But no, I'm not going to do anything else. Yeah, I don't see anything in the rules that describe a con another consequence for failure other than failing, but um, it's entirely possible I might have missed it too. So. But yeah, after after Jin's turn, it's the police. So their their functional car goes zooming up to the uh, to the smoke. And uh, kind of up and around it some, and let's see if they can see through that concealment. Never. They slow down and kind of pull around to stop, and uh, like one of the cops gets out and starts looking around, and it seems like they don't know where you went. Um, Rooster or and Denen, would you like to do anything else? Well, uh, no, sir. I'm Otherwise, I'm going to cut back around to Skipper, and I think at this point it's important for you to do well on a stealth test <laughs> to seal the deal and slip away. As you look back on the scene, you see yep, looks like that cop car has been fooled. There's other two cop cars that are basically currently doing this sort of a uh, looping uh, race kind of thing around the truck stop. Either you can't tell if they're chasing or being chased by ancients. Like uh, elf gangers on bikes with like bright green on all over the place. They're 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 firing guns in the air, shooting at the cops. The cops are shooting back at them. Um, you see that 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 girl that you guys saw on the bike before, the the sort of small elf chick with the glowing tattoos. Uh, Skipper, you weren't here for that, but um, she reaches down and like pulls this. Looks like she just pulled the exhaust tube off the side of the motorcycle, but then she she pulls a release and moves something, puts it on your shoulder, and you realize it's a concealed rocket launcher. It oh fires and just completely obliterates a semi that was parked nearby. And they all cheer as if, you know, that was what they wanted to do. So that's kind of what's going on behind the scenes. Um, it might actually not be so hard to slip away now that you think of it. <laughs> um, <laughs> give me your stealth roll. That seems like a good time to slip away. I think the cops found their suspects right there. Yeah. All right, so I got one success to start. I might spend some edge here. Um, you know, I'm going to give you an edge because you're concealed and uh, they're not looking your way. That uh, seems like a good excuse for a situational edge point. I will take that and spend another one with it to reroll two of these dice. That's it. Two more hits, so three total. Yeah, with that on top of the concealment and the fact that there's not too many people like kind of actively looking for you, there's those two cops like, where did that truck go? <laughs> How could it have gone? Look around, they must be invisible. And, you know, by that point, you're like half a mile away. <laughs> so hey, you find yourself like rolling, al rolling along this frontage road uh, next to some cornfields uh, next to Highway 41, uh, heading northbound in the dark. Uh, with your headlights off, I imagine, because you're a rigger and who needs headlights uh, to give your position away. <laughs> right, yeah. And, yeah, your car just reeks of blood and uh, cordite and uh, is that water bottle in the back. It's going to go... Like, hanging on. Looks rather cartoonish, almost like a if someone 
who had never seen a water bottle before, like a plastic water bottle, like you guys say, if someone who'd never seen one before was described what they look like and then drew a character out of it. <laughs> All right, guys, so uh, what's the next step here? Wasn't there something about a nuclear device? Oh, man. I, I, I don't know if we have what we need or that we have the the capacity in our current states to actually do anything about it, so maybe it's time to run. Yeah, I don't know what the I, frag to um, do. I know that Lone yeah, Star's did, looking for us. That. I know that this Jaunton tried to kill us. Who else is after us? I, uh, I, I want to ask everyone to look around the city... Maybe you are attached, maybe you are not. But I'm thinking that maybe we leave. And uh, if a nuclear bomb goes off, will not change the city much. No. <sighs> you know, part of me wants to say we need to take care of this. But part of me also just realized that I'm missing a fragging arm. When did this happen? Oh, we oh. should probably get him to a uh, street dock. It happened shortly after I lost the skin on my face. Oh, Which time? Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> so, to a vote, I say we go to Milwaukee, so we're outside of the main Chicago area. In case a nuke does go off, find uh, some sort of doctor to take care of our various ailments. And uh, if Chicago has not exploded by the time we're better, then we go back in and see if we can track down this canyon character. I approve of this plan. All right, so you uh, find a spot to hop on hop on highway uh, 41 a few minutes later after following the, the kind of broken down frontage roads that almost no one uses uh, except for uh, a number of the giant farming drones. And um uh, about an hour and a half, or about an hour and a half, yeah, about an hour and a half, more like an hour later, I'd say, you're, you're starting to pull into Milwaukee. There's sort of this long stretch of not as much between Milwaukee and Chicago, except for, like, all the businesses that have sort of moved up along the highway. So it's sort of like a, for a sprawl, I mean, Chicago, Milwaukee's sort of seen as, like, part of Chicago, right? But it's kind of like this, this tendril of a sprawl. <laughs> It's like thing goes out and then <laughs> Milwaukee. And then you get like a little Green Bay and Fox cities kind of sticking out the top of that sort of around the, the mitten side of Wisconsin. Um, so with that, you find yourself uh, pulling in, pulling it off the highway into Milwaukee, which is a shining, thriving metropolis. Tons of corpse pouring money into here. Lots of uh, sort of new HQs being built as, as all these corps that are moving to, to step into Chicago and, and do things uh, are using Milwaukee as a, a very um, convenient base of operations among others but so so does anyone have any contacts in Milwaukee no <laughs> not that I'm aware of I'm just sleeping in the car. I hurt. Isn't uh, Milwaukee an Indian name? As I are the names of many places in Wisconsin, actually. Though we don't say Indian these days. Uh, right. Well, I guess a... Amerindian is okay. But... <laughs> it, was, it was a quote from right. Wayne. Yep, yep. <laughs> oh, right, that is. Yep. I, yes, I, Pete, it it's is. It's been so long. Actually, it's pronounced... Milwaukee, which is Algonquin <laughs> for the good land. <laughs> <laughs> mm, uh, one of my all-time favorite movies. Indeed. I don't think I've seen it since I was 17. I should probably watch it again. Well, as long as we're looking for context here, I was really hoping someone else had one. Uh, I've got my ex-girlfriend. Is her name Alice? <laughs> No, it's Vicky. Let's call her Alice. This is Cooper. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and tell us about Vicky. 
Uh, Vicky currently has custody of our daughter. Uh, and she's an anarchist journalist based out of, uh, you know, one of the slums areas of Milwaukee. Okay. Let's see. Uh, you gonna give her a call? What's her connection rating? Uh, Never mind. It's not that high. She yeah, answers. connection three. And the reason I said that is like it's it's a roll that it's, it's a dice roll. I think I pulled it from the Shatter and Missions FAQ, but I'm not 100 percent sure. If you're gonna attempt to call a contact, a good way to tell if they're around is just answer the phone when you call them. Is you roll two d6 and add it up. If it's higher than their connection rating, then they're not tied up and busy. Uh, but if it's equal to or less than their connection rating, they'll have to call you back later or something. So. Uh, the idea being that the higher the connection rating, the more in the band the contact is. The lower the connection mm. rating, the more likely it is they're home uh, binging Netflix. Wow, that's neat. I like that. That's a good, quick, easy way to determine. So you're not going to be calling up Damien Knight. <laughs> right. Mm. Oh, you've got Damien Knight as a contact, but <laughs> let's see if you can roll box cars. <laughs> nope. Good luck, because he's got better things to do. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> All right, so you you call up Vicky, and uh, this is pretty late at night, I believe. Uh, but she's kind of a night owl. She, she picks up the phone and says, "Oh, it's you." you? I'm not. I'm not excited about it either. What's going on? It's late. Everything okay? I mean, not like I care. Uh, well, you know, I wouldn't be calling you if things are going great. Uh. Listen, we were in Chicago. A couple of uh, cops showed up. Well, first there, Johnson turned on us, and then some ancients showed up, and then the cops showed up, and we just need to lay low. We got a couple of bullet wounds that need patched. If you know any doctors in town, uh, we're in real bad shape. Damn. Well, you know, I'd love to and all, but uh, do you think that's a good idea for... To bring around our kid you uh you want to bring that kind of trouble down around her i mean are you being chased or anything are you sure you're not being followed yeah i think we got out of there pretty clean although who knows you know mr johnson might have mentioned something about us to someone else but they're definitely not gonna be looking for us in milwaukee you know uh whitney should be asleep we'll just slip down to the basement uh, try and keep quiet as much as we can. We'll be in and out of there in three, four days. Uh, who's we? How we, many people do you have with you? You know uh, that troll, have, uh, what was his name? Uh, uh, Axe Job or something? I can't remember. He was... uh, oh, no, Axe Job. He, he moved to Seattle. He hit the big time. Oh, no, really? Uh, yeah, no, I got uh, Rooster Gin and Denen back here and um, some kind of giant water bottle. I don't know if he got that from a mascot or I don't know where that form comes from. Never mind. Uh, just wait, wait, why are you calling me? You haven't talked to me in weeks. We're last time. You remember what you said last time? You know, I, I wasn't proud of it, but um, it's just it's it, we're in a real tight spot here, you know. And I'm doing the best that I can. She seems a bit torn, but and she goes, and her lips kind of tighten with that thing. Like you've seen it before, we argue with her. We're like, she's decided she's gonna go along with something, but now she's gonna ask for something. <laughs> of course. All right, but, um, well, this sounds like something you might have, uh, a tip or something about. If you're going to be staying in this place, I mean, we're not together. We're not getting back together. So this is business, right? Strictly business. And, uh, yeah, we've seen some things in the CZ that, uh, you might be interested in. I'm going to hate myself for this in the morning. Uh, all right, come on by. Uh, it's a different place, though. Let me give you the new address. I just moved last month. Uh, corp jobs uh, paid over the old place. And gentrification's a killer. Yeah, well... 
Not as bad as it is down south, though. At least some of the things I've heard. What's going on down there? The corpse don't want people to know. Well, just been down there. What am I saying? Just all right. Come on by and just don't don't frag with me on this, Skipper. Okay, I can't I can't handle this shit if you're gonna pull a frag at a roller coaster. So just business, okay? Thank you so much. Just business. And she you get a little blip on her phone as she sends you an address pin and then hangs up. It's a safe place to hang out for at least a couple days. Uh, we'll have to stay in the basement. Uh, I definitely don't want my daughter getting involved in any of our situations here. All right, so you head north, uh, kind of past the bulk of Milwaukee, uh, kind of out a, a little bit further away from Chicago proper, even to this area of town called Germantown. And there's, it's mostly a residential area. There's a lot of houses in here that look like they haven't been uh, kept up or repaired since, uh, well, before the awakening. That's maybe an exaggeration by a little bit. Uh, you, we pull up to this uh, kind of two-story, rundown looking house, um, but it's got a decent yard and there's some, you know, looks like there's some different uh, garden stuff set up outside. Uh, uh, kind of a, I guess like prepper gardening sort of thing, you know, like a, or more like a, more like adaptive cyber cyberpunk tech sort of thing. So using using a uh, you know uh, tubes for network uh, network cable conduits or something as a uh, as a, the basis with, with holes poked in it for an irrigation system or something. Though maybe there aren't network cables as often. Oh, sure there are. They have to be in some places. But <laughs> anyway, um, you pull up to the place. It's pretty dark, and then you see. You see this uh, dark, small form uh, sitting on, uh, sitting in old run, old rundown. Looks like it's about to fall apart in any moment. Um, uh, I can't think of the word. Uh, it's a bench that's suspended by chains, and it hangs and it swings. <laughs> it's a swinging chair thing. <laughs> I know they have a better name than that, but my vocabulary is not functional at the moment. <laughs> okay, I'm with you. I, I picture it sagging in the middle like under her very little weight um and uh, as as you uh, pull up you can see her like this little green light of her fate pen light up and gives off a little puff of smoke and steps forward all right come on in be quiet she's sleeping all right and i'm gonna gesture to these guys and we're gonna quietly creep through the house and sneak down into the basement area Right. Everyone, as... give me a stealth plus agility roll. Yeah, I was about to say I'm going to be as quiet as I can. <laughs> <laughs> and she kind of w watches the the different people go by in their various states of mangling, and just like gives these oh, oh. unmangled, not... <laughs> unmangled gin gets four. All right. Yeah, she's trying not to like point it out or be rude or anything but she's also like visually shaken by the injuries you're displaying so kind of nods to Jin as he goes by does my ur no does my urban specialization in stealth count <laughs> I should say so all right I love it how many hits zero. did you get Sam? Zero? zero oh boy I got three hits man I out stealthed you with a bloody stump of an arm so you're moving My on through. Face Move is on. ugly. Super quiet, and uh, you, um, uh, Dinan, like you bump into something, like bump your shin. It's like a coffee table or something, and you start to trip and like put your hand down, like you put your hand like in something that's like wet and squishy. It feels like, like a pile of gore or something, and you pull up your hand, and it's like got red chunks on it dripping down your arm. You realize it's salsa. Is it chunky salsa? Yeah, it's pretty chunky. Hey <laughs> uh, yeah, you sort of so see that on your hand and then some of it drips down. You've got like these maybe cuts or some injuries here and there or like a scrape or something on your arm and it just it gets on there. It's really salty and it starts to sting. And <sighs> And you're making a little bit of noise. Not so much you've wake you've woken up the baby yet, but uh 
yeah, you there was a loud thump and, and kind of thing. So <laughs> with that, you didn't glitch, so you didn't like fall down and break the coffee table or something. Like <laughs> this time. Uh, with that, you continue creeping on down and get into the basement. And it's a pretty like okay, when you think of basements, like this basement, it's it's, it's really old, it's made of concrete. There's huge cracks in the wall here and there. Like the 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 far the up basically half of it has uh, covered by a puddle of water with a few like old kind of chugging um, like a water heater and things just sort of sitting in there like it, there's some rust and you you see some movement in there and you think ah devil rats but that's just a couple of regular rats um, this place this this it smells musty and mildewy and there's like a few piles of molding cloth in one corner uh, an old washing machine that uh, looks like it's missing some key components and uh Home sweet home. Yep, and uh, his, his skipper, you go sort of start. Uh, she leads you over to the basement. Uh, she's got her uh, comm link out with the light on, so you can see without giving off too much light. All right, here we go. Sorry, uh, it's not as nice as the last basement, but well, it's a hole in the ground. Uh, you guys need something? Uh, water, some food. Well, some uh, aspirin. Water's probably good. Aspirin. <laughs> Yeah, he, he's got a couple scratches there. And we'll, I don't want to bother you. We'll just get some food delivered here in the morning. But I know most of these guys really just need to sleep. Jesus, Skipper, look at these. Like, What have you gotten yourself into? Is that guy missing an arm? It's what not happens? missing. I know exactly where it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you get an edge back for that. <laughs> <laughs> I know I said Look, this was just business, but I see in this track, like, what's what's happening? Like, you were never involved in this kind of direct before. Oh, well, not... At least nothing went this bad. Yeah, well, you know, I start working with this guy, Big Dave, everything seems on the up and up, and all of a sudden there's a uh, minor tactical nuke floating around the CZ somewhere controlled by a ganger named Canyon. <laughs> Good one. Uh, all right, <laughs> hold on a second. <laughs> you and I are going to take care of our business right away. Uh, let me get my recorders and stuff. Oh, oh I got to get the med kit. Uh, she sort of, uh, you want to give me a hand? And she leads you around through the house and just kind of hands you some things to help gather them up. And uh, basically some, like a jug of water. And uh, she's got some sort of like weird, like, multiple tubes and like contraption filtration system thing that she pulls a, a water jug out from underneath and uh, sticks another one underneath it and um, like pops open the fridge and uh, uh, like reaches back and pulls out a, a like a few different like snack looking things and uh, uh, before uh, uh, and uh, she closes that up and like reaches up at the top of it and like turns a crank a few times like for like maybe 15 or so times you recognize it as like this like some sort of a jury rigged uh, like power generation thing for doing re recharge stuff so she says uh, uh, Seller's direct when it's this cloudy well Hold at on. night too I'll charge it up Here, you you know where everything else is and um, yeah before long she's gathered some supplies for the team so you've got uh, additional med kit supplies or a med kit if you need it you've got food and water and uh, there's also a few like cots and sleeping bags that she can bring down and uh, like brings down this little like small air freshen stuffer shack air freshener thing sets it down and presses a button and and it starts giving off uh, uh, this uh, uh, coffee cinnamon smell. All right. Well, uh, I think this is where this should be a good safe spot for us to hang out for a couple days. She nods, I guess as long as your friends can stand the accommodations. I'm afraid it might not be very sanitary down there. I haven't had a chance to do anything proper with the basement. There was there was some nasty stuff down there when we got the police. Well, I'll go out and get some bleach in the morning. She uh, then goes over and sits down, uh, turns on the tread, uh, puts it on mute, 
uh, essentially, again, to just give off some light in the room. Uh, takes out her comlink and uh, says, all right, uh, why don't you tell me all about it? Big Dave, that name sounds familiar. He's a local fixer, isn't he? Right? I think uh, I don't know much about him, but small time, I think. Well, not super small time, but not not one of the big movers and shakers. Maybe an up and comer. Uh, was an up and comer. Ah, he was your Johnson then, or fixer tried to. You said a fixer it, tried to geek. Yeah, we we greased him maybe two hours ago now. Wow, that's um. How are you gonna get any more? Never mind. That's not my business. Uh, so why? Uh, well, there's uh, something to do with a body that we recovered, and uh, they he uh, he just turned his goons on us. There was Lola and Bebop. All of a sudden, there's a mono whip flying around. Oh, I guess that accounts for that guy's arm, huh? Uh, get any footage of any of this? I mean, not the arm thing necessarily. I don't. We don't need to air that. But uh, we end up saving any of that footage of uh, Canyon. I don't know. That's a Jim's Jim Jim. I it's Jim's certainly department. wasn't recording anything. I think it came through like you weren't expecting it, right? As a sort of like burst, you were able to kind of see. But I don't remember if anyone actually captured it. If you don't specifically remember either, then I'm going to say no. Why haven't I been calling you Jim this whole time? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so with that, you have sort of a, you end up talking like for several hours, or just like asking you questions and some details and things. Like, how forthcoming are you? I'm forthcoming. I mean, I'm not going to give away any, any information that might identify uh, us as someone. This is just, as far as her article is concerned, we're just going to be the team. Although I do trust her pretty well. We have loyalty connection of four, and she's an anarchist journalist, so I know she's on the right side. She already knows who we are. Well, it's just Wait, what is it making it for the story? <laughs> you, you named them all on our way over. <laughs> no, no, you guys, you guys. The I don't care if they know who Canyon and Danon is. She's going to have to be careful about what she puts into her article, but I'm giving her actual names because she might know someone who knows someone. No, I'm just saying you gave him. You gave her all of our names on the way over. Yep. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm just yeah, saying it's ending, fine. Ending to not mention our names now, or that she doesn't know who we are. <laughs> She's I'm an not going to name names, but someone's <laughs> lost an arm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and Skipper, you would know that like just it's basically unspoken at this point. If you're a source, uh, she's not going to reveal you. Unless right, you right, wanted yeah. to be revealed, which obviously you would say, and, and it would be really weird. Mm-hmm. And she'd ask you what the hell's going on. Uh, <laughs> we we are the story. <laughs> we we killed a bunch of people in broad daylight. Yeah, but only because we had to. I, I I trust her. It's fine. And she does a little bit of looking around, and she was able to confirm that Matador uh, was recently hired for for a job with another small team. And they, he actually acquired something, um, uh, something called an Ares encryption key. And in the context of what you told her before, she's like, "Oh, Drek." So you got dragged into both of these things through Big Dave. Yeah, you know, when you actually start to put the pieces together like that, it does look like that. Yeah. All right. Well, I don't like jumping to conclusions with all the, the information, but looking looking here, it seems like you were hired to do a job. You came across this thing. Are they maybe they became aware of you or something, and they they got to your fixer somehow. Maybe he was checking around and wasn't subtle enough, and this canyon guy got to him, or maybe he was working with him to begin with, and this has been a setup all along. But uh, yeah, you guys were sent in to go get the key. After this thing pops up, it, it can't be a complete coincidence. Um, as far as the nuke goes, though, you know, I, I'm i not super worried about it going off around here. Those things are worth a lot of money to the right people. Um, 
nobody you'd want buying one though. So in that sense, it's still fragging scary. Ugh. But man, I wish Jami Five Toes didn't retire. That was a good fixer. <laughs> Johnny Five Toes? Uh, wasn't he the one who hired you guys to uh, to break into the that uh, Ares facility? And he told you it was Shiawase? Yeah, you know, minor glitch, but I never felt like he was going to really betray us like this. Yeah, he said they just drew down on you in the middle of a meet? That's... They were planning it, right? Definitely. There's no way they just happened to have that amount of arms ready to go. So what are you going to do? Well, we can just leave this encryption key or that uh, tactical nuke just floating around out there for anyone. You think you can do something about that? Well, I gotta try, right? No. No, you, you don't. <laughs> you don't have to try direct. You've already been through the gauntlet on this. This is over your head. This is above your pay grade. I mean, this is a story I can work with. Maybe I can do something with it. Work with my contacts. I'm not just going to try to break it open as a story, right? I'm an anarchist journalist. It's not about, you know, media clicks and how many follows and subscribers I get. It's about the mission. And, uh... Yeah, well... You're right. Maybe our part here is done. Maybe, uh... Maybe you ought to think about Seattle. Seattle sounds wonderful. I agree with the matter. I'm going to a doctor first. <laughs> oh, uh, yes. Does anyone have a uh, med kit? <laughs> yeah, she, yeah, she had brought a med kit downstairs for you, along with some extra supplies and things I had said. So, so yeah, you've got some medical supplies and some stuff to help clean up the place a bit down there and some cots and things and a little battery-powered trid set that's, like, super tiny. <laughs> Um, Look, and, Skipper. Uh, yeah, I don't... you have time to lay low for a little while. Yeah. So go ahead. Um, look, Skipper. I don't. Uh, I don't want to barge in on a conversation that's clearly got a lot of background that I'm not involved in. So, but she's right. She's speaking a lot of wisdom. You don't have to be the hero on this one. Yeah, she always was smarter than me. Uh, is now a good time for a break, Cliff? Um, almost. There's, there's a couple more things I want to do. Um, so over the next couple of days or so, you kind of get yourself situated, do a little bit of healing up, or maybe a lot of healing up. <laughs> uh, Rooster, um, she actually, um, it turns out that Vicky is kind of a crafty person. She's got a couple other people that actually live here as well and you're not quite sure what they work for her or work with her or what's up with them but uh um they help with the kid and uh doing stuff around the house and people are just doing that looks like they're like working on sort of uh restoring the house to some degree but not anywhere near to its original form they're adding on all this sort of like a uh, low-tech jury rigged you know survival logistic stuff uh rain catchers uh, water filtration systems uh, hydroponics gardening, hanging gardening right. stuff, uh, grazed beds as well, and uh, so they're they're growing a bunch of food. They also have like a like a number of different rooms in here, just set up with different tools. And I call them a workshop, but it's more like there's a room where there's a whole bunch of scattered tools that are kind of about the same thing, with maybe like a workbench. It's cool. it's pretty um, uh, it seems disorganized. There's lots of parts and things around, but uh. Um, over the course of the, the, the next day or so, uh, Vicky uh, has you, uh, like, swings by and uh, hands you this thing. It's like a harness you can strap on. It gives you a little prosthetic arm. And um, there's a little uh, cable you can plug into for uh, DNI or something. It's really simple electronics, right? It's not a full neural interface, but you can send simple commands to, like, open and close the hand. <laughs> so I can, like, pick up a drink and open a door. <laughs> Yeah, pretty simple stuff. Like you grab things, right? It's yeah. it's not much great. It's not much better than one of those like grippy things that you have the lever and it goes pick things up or whatever. But mm -hmm. it's it's a 
She kind of looks at us and says, well, it's no cyber arm. Uh, you're probably going to want something better, but it might help you for a while. Hey, thanks. You could put a glove over it, too, and wear a sleeve. Uh, might not draw as much attention as a, a one-armed orc soldier. Appreciate the help. I'm coming to terms with my new... Uh, uh, face maintenance... <laughs> as I uh, get up and go to bed every night, and yeah, does, uh, does she bring Danen one of those like Phantom of the Opera masks? <laughs> <laughs> My new skin uh, routine. Yeah. Wouldn't it be hilarious if we started calling Danen the face from now on? <laughs> <laughs> I like it. <laughs> She's like, awkward hey, and ugly. Why don't we send in the face? <laughs> <laughs> Um, she does make the offer that she knows someone who can get nano paste disguises. They don't work for very long, but if you need to sort of pass it without drawing attention, it might be a good temporary solution for your crossing borders I, or something. I would like that contact. Yeah, they're expensive and I don't have them, so you'll need to pay for them, but I can get you a good deal. Thanks. And uh, Skipper, you sort of uh, almost fall into an odd, somewhat familiar, but also awkward rhythm with uh, uh, with Vicky here. You get to see your daughter again. And she, uh... let's see, uh, when was the last time you saw your daughter? Uh, was, was she? Uh, it was about two months ago. Uh, Whitney is four years old. So she's, daddy, and runs up and gives you a hug. Yep. And while I'm here, too, I am not using Bliss. I do not do that in the same apartment as my daughter or house or whatever it is. Uh, but, yeah, definitely once I get home. And she, while you're holding her, she looks over at her mom and says, Did Daddy come home to stay? Oh. And Vicky's like, No, sorry, honey. Uh, enjoy the visit. And and she seems a bit disappointed, but then, you know, perks up again when she gets your attention, so. Yeah, well, maybe in a couple weeks we can go to Six Flags. I'm just trying to picture what there is to do for a four, what there is for a four-year-old to do at Six Flags. <laughs> Most of the rides, you have to be a bit taller. Yeah, I guess so. I haven't been back there in a long time, but yeah, she says, oh, yay! And yeah, of course, there's the, the rides that splash you and stuff too, I imagine. But uh, yeah, so you have um, you have a chance to, I guess, rest up and recuperate and maybe plan your next move. I realize you don't really have any leads on this Matador guy. If maybe you'd have taken your fixer alive, <laughs> uh, he might have had some information or have been convinced to give some information up, but I understand that was a bit of a hectic situation, right? So There's a, there's a lot of things we could have done in this campaign. <laughs> so ultimately, I'm going to say uh, you kind of lick your wounds, make your plans, uh, kind of use up some of your Nuyen that you made here and there, and uh, work on how the heck you're going to maybe get out of here or move on to somewhere else, because Chicago... Chicago didn't go so well. No, no. And I think we'll uh, more or less roll credits there. Uh, I've got uh, kind of an epilogue info dump for people who want to know what the hell is going on behind the scenes with a little, little yeah. bit more detail. Um, and we can talk about our experiences with 6th Edition, what we thought of it, playing it for the first campaign, and uh, yeah, come back for that. Cool. All right. Ten minutes? Yep. Ten minutes? Well, We're going to take yeah, a while we take a break, don't forget to click on that link and go back the Kickstarter so you can have a cyberpunk fantasy series. Yeah, and man. If you can't afford to back it, or even if you can, share it with as many people as you think might even be remotely interested. Absolutely. Do that. Click that link. Check it out. There's a lot of really cool stuff going on over there, um, and uh, we'd all love to see that happen. We're going to take a quick 10-minute break, then we're going to talk about what happened, and then we're going to talk about Shadowrun some more. So stick around, um, get your friends to come who love to hear us uh, analyze the Sixth World stuff, and we'll... Uh, analyze. Analyze, yeah. <laughs> and we'll, uh, we'll be right back with that. 
Stick around.
Hey everybody, we're back with our Shadowrun 6th edition actual play uh, epilogue slash final analysis discussion chat about 6th edition Shadowrun and what we're thinking about it, what we, how we're feeling about it after playing through this uh, this eight episode series and uh, and and all of that. Um, so, uh, Mr. Johnson, we have just, um, failed to save anybody. Uh. <laughs> well, that's not entirely the case. Okay, okay, let's hear it. Because you guys really didn't have any idea what was really happening. <laughs> Alright, so what was going on here is this guy named Cannon. He's a, uh, a smuggler, runner, kind of a corporate sellout, kind of, you know, cold-blooded runner type, and... Well, let's just say that there are some corp. Let's just say that there are some uh, corporations that would be interested in um, spreading some disinformation about a catastrophe that might occur. And uh, this was an elaborate plan to spread disinformation about what might be a potential cause of that. Oh. Um, it's not necessarily a big one, but um, you know certain people responsible for doing certain bad things that are going to be happening in the future that I really have to be cagey about because NDA stuff. Um, <laughs> but I mean, people have heard about like the, the events of the blackout, right? Like who caused the blackout? Mm -hmm. Somebody uh, may need to cover that up. And uh, yeah, some corporations are involved in covering things up, whether or not they're, they may have been involved. Some corporate, um, I like that. That's no true. Well, maybe corporations are like lots of different factions, right? So, yeah. I won't say what's going on because I can't, but but at least some corporations are interested in people not really knowing what really happens with with the big thing that's coming up. So essentially, essentially this, this was this a big was... Uh, disinformation plan. This guy Cannon w was hired to uh, basically fake that there was a nuke on the loose. Well, and that makes they... me feel better. And he is a cold-blooded bass. So he basically like got this this case for a nuke, right? That that's not really a functional nuke, but made everyone around him believe that he had one. And then hit the decker on his team flipped out and tried to betray him, which was exactly what he wanted him to do to like get some information out there. And then he offed him. Um, now the actual encryption key was something that could be found and tracked down. And so Canyon uh, used. Uh, uh, use another fixer to hire Matador and his team to acquire the encryption key so that it would be known that a nuke encryption key was out there uh, to some people. And then um, he had essentially uh, caught on to you guys because you'd been starting to ask around about him and the nuke and stuff. And so he was able to track down, uh, you know, who, um, who took the bait and uh, used you then to go get Matador and was essentially going to um, uh, acquire the encryption key and do something with it. He didn't really have a super big plan. The most important thing is for people to think that there's a nuke out there somewhere, right? So <sighs> ultimately, <laughs> cleaning up some loose ends uh, when you screwed things up and didn't have the guy or the key, like actually Canyon's guys, uh, another team that Canyon hired, like went in and like geeked the people and got the key. They were going to geek you there, actually, now that I think of it. Um, but then you got the dock wagon geek instead, um, and what, yeah, when it came down to it, is a uh, yeah. The um, when Big Dave found out it did work, he called uh, Canyon, who he didn't know was the one hiring him actually, and let him know what had happened, and was just told to basically uh, ice the runners and, and recover uh, the body and anything with it. So um, with that, no, that last part's not true. Sorry, I'm, he was not told to recover the body. He was just told to ice you guys, and. Um, uh, ultimately, ultimately, his mission succeeded uh, through your actions because you got word so. to the reporter. You got a bunch of intel out. There's going to be all this disinformation out there about a mini nuke that doesn't really exist. So we so played that, right into his hand. Yeah. So that when there's some sort of big catastrophe, somebody could be like, "Well, there was that mini nuke that was stolen a while ago by a shadow runner." I love it. Uh, I love. So it. That, that's kind of where I was going with it. It's, we it's like a bit accordion. convoluted. It's a bit convoluted, and I didn't, I didn't really. Expect I didn't really um, expect it to go like one way or another. I I figured you guys might actually track down an encounter canyon at some point. That, that was a possibility, or but we were just more like 
dealing with the the runs that were put in front of you and yeah. i sort of like created this backstory to kind of weave it together and I love ultimately it. i don't feel like it was my most successful campaign planning uh, I did feel you like name him canon was that like a a subtle a subtle hint to that, that you were tying it into actual canon no no his name is canyon uh, but no, I didn't think of that. And I, I guess not. Never mind. I should take credit <laughs> for it. But, but no, it's a, a, I, I took little ideas that were inspirations and kind of like wove them in a little bit. And yeah. I planted some seeds and uh, saw what you guys would uh, sort of jump towards. And I think a little bit early on, we all sort of underestimated just how much more deadly this game is. Sure. <laughs> Particularly the, the, the Demon Rat Venom. I would say so. Uh, here's the thing, I don't... You, ultimately, your character has kind of failed. Yeah, I don't your goal feel of being like, successful Shadowrunners. Yeah, I don't feel like I... I super min-maxed, but then again... You know, like, I don't, I don't know that I... I don't know that this run was like a, like a full-on Decker's dream either. I think I might have made him differently if, you know, I mean, if, if I... I don't know. I don't know what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I thought my character was built for the stuff that we encountered, but um, but combats, uh, you, I just, is it? Let me let me preface this by saying what I'm about to say is not a complaint. This is exactly what I was hoping for with um, changes in sixth edition. But but combat has uh, the with the way things have changed with the new edge system. Um, I've had to think so much differently about combat than I've ha than I've had to in the past that um, that I wasn't even though I was pr even though I was hoping for and maybe in a way trying to prepare myself for that general idea because I was hoping for it I just um, I wasn't prepared for uh, the ways I would have to think differently and it was just the edge system really does throw things. Um, for a loop, in my opinion, in a very positive way. I really enjoyed the little um, sort of like problem solving on a really minor individual level that you have to do from combat turn to combat turn. I agree with that. It feels yeah, a lot more tactical. Mm -hmm. Right, it feels, it feels tactical, tactical and all that your all of your decisions feel important. All of your edge decisions feel important. Yeah. Like, if I use this here, this could be great. I mean, this could be really great, but then what's going to happen next turn that's going to make me go, damn it, I wish I didn't use all that edge. Um, Tsukasa says, uh, in regards to being more deadly, do you guys feel like base damage is adjusted slash lowered to compensate for the lack of armor? Um, it yes. is. Like, I can see the numbers on the page, yes. Definitely. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make it less deadly. I mean, I guess it would make it... You're still, I think, a lot less likely to just shrug off all damage from an attack like you might have been able to before. Right. And I think, ultimately, what what really makes this system deadly isn't so much the lack of armor, the smaller soak pool, um, or anything like that. I think it has mostly to do with you only get to do one edge expenditure every combat round, yes. period. So you you don't have the opportunity to like kind of save up your edge and use a whole bunch of it on a few defense tests over the course of the run, uh, so that well maybe not over the course of the run, but um, I'm just saying here, yeah, you you have to be really careful about using your edge because if you use it on your defense test, then you don't have it to reroll in your body, and so a lot of times you're just stuck with how the dice fall. And yeah. there was a lot more dice manipulation I think you could do in sixth and fifth edition, as long as you didn't make edge your dump stats. Yep. And I would love to see uh, somehow a way to build a character like maybe through maybe there's a quality that allows you to use edge twice in a in combat in a combat turn or um, over the course of a round or maybe like wouldn't it would be cool if that were some if that in, somehow were an effect of wired reflexes for example. Um, that you could take, uh, you you could use edge twice instead of just once. Um, it would be neat to be because I I do think you're absolutely right, Mr. Johnson. Uh, using only being able to use edge once 
is a huge restrictor and not necessarily in a bad way I'm not saying it's a bad thing that's why I'm not saying that you should that that should be changed but it makes you think a lot about how am I going to use that edge and I think that that could be if it were a quality for example I think it would have to be a very expensive quality very hard to get quality to be able to use edge twice or something like that but I think that could be a really big it would be a huge advantage I don't know. Yeah, like a super yeah, luck, super, super luck, lucky super quality, luck. says uh, says uh, Kevilak in the in the chat. Yeah. I think for me, it's so I'm more RP and story than crunch, um, which yep. I know is not what Shadowrun is known for. But like, I feel like if I were to make myself the cheat sheet, like I need it for Edge. Like, there's no way I'm memorizing for a while what all of these do. Um, so. Yeah, it's I also think pretty for... compact, though, too. Like, if you, I've got in my cheat sheet here, this this one little section here pretty thoroughly describes what all the edge actions do. So I think if you... I, I re recommend print out the page if you have a PDF and, like, cut out that section stick it somewhere, like, on your character sheet or somewhere where you can refer to it. That'll help a lot. Yeah, that's going to be... A... Extent, but that's also very character-specific. So, you know, yeah. if you get the wild eye, if you get, like, for my summoning or the logic... Um, roles for opti or 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 so everyone can get it in so many different ways too not just how you spend it but also in how you get it that it's like as a new player it took me a few times of sitting down and playing before i was like okay this is how i can use the character yeah, and you ultimately figured out a good way for you to build up edges to summon spirits uh and i think, I that's, think kind that's kind of interesting, interesting right you can you can spend reagents when you summon a spirit uh, to get an edge point and in a way that kind of seems like a little cheesy because like oh how is summoning a spirit going to help you with the later action you're going to use your edge on but i also kind of see that as like you're you're giving an offering to the spirits and you're getting some like help from them i guess in that way that might be sort of a luck based or a subtle magical influence so in that way i think it makes sense i do like the way the edge system abstracts a lot of things you don't have to think as much about like I think the most complicated thing when it was a rooster was in a car and there's smoke going around and the windows rolled down and it's weaving around and the police officer trying to shoot at him from his own car. Like normally I'd look up a whole host of charts and do pluses and minuses and end up with the end result. Right. But, um, but in this case, I just go, uh, let's see. Um, I'm going to give you cover. That makes sense. So I used yeah. that. So that was kind of a situational modifier, um, that I kind of gave him. But, and then I was like, and uh, you get an edge. And that was really all I had to think about. Yeah, it was pretty I re quick and easy. I really do see the the edge system, the abstraction, uh, and getting away from uh, tons of situational modifiers like you're just talking about. I really do see that as being m the biggest benefit for GMs and making it easier for GMs to run combat situations. Yeah, I just wish, I just wish they'd made it consistent so yep, that the, that's one of my big it problems. replaces all plus or minus dice pool situational modifiers. I remember all early on when I was reading <laughs> the rules and writing my my uh, my anal analysis or whatever it was, you know, um, I remember a, an early big note that I kept writing over and over again was I thought you I thought we were getting rid of modifiers I th <laughs> because it's like it's it's. It seems to be, have been gotten rid of in large part, but it, they pop up here and there, like little areas yeah, where... Cover is so, one. It gives you extra dice in your defense test based yeah. on the cover rating. Mm -hmm. Sorry, go ahead. One of the things that I am getting less fond of as I play more and more RPGs more and more mm -hmm. is anything that anything that makes me go, oh, yeah, I forgot to do that, right? Yep. Like, yep. If, if I go through, like, four or five games and went, oh, shoot, I forgot I was supposed to be doing that, it tells me kind of that I shouldn't, that it shouldn't be there in the first place. Um, and that is kind of what, like on one hand, I love the edge system. I love, this is my favorite thing about Shadowrun 6E, the decking and the and the edge system. Um, but the, my least favorite thing is having to compare the, the, the attack rating and the defense rating beforehand. It just... It just doesn't feel quick, and it doesn't feel fun. That's a really good point, because we did that We did that all the time, right? Where we were like, oh, yeah, 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 hey, let's do the attack rating thing. Right, and like it just doesn't feel intuitive 
and I and I'm getting to the point now in in my game design where if it doesn't feel intuitive, people are going to forget it mm. and probably not use it as much as you want them to. Right. And, and like I get when I saw ahead, when Mr. I saw the edge system actually in early play testing with the chip system, I was like I hate this so much. Yeah. Why are we doing a mini game? to determine like this other thing yeah. before we even get to the die roll. It's a whole other step. This is gonna suck. But and I think it, it got just closer. Doesn't. It's, it actually flows pretty smoothly. I mean, it is an extra step you've got to remember, but I've actually found like once I get used to it at least that it act. It yeah, doesn't. it's not awful, but like if you have a GM who's like consistently on it and just asking like, hey, what's your, what's your rating? What's your rating? What's your rating? That's fine. But I found myself never thinking about it and only kind of secondarily saying, like, oh, cool, I won. Or, oh, no, I didn't win. You know what I mean? Like, it was just... I think it will this be... Is, this is personal. I think this is it personal will be preference. Matter, I don't yeah. want to... I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't mean to keep cutting you off. Um, That's true. I think it really yeah, is a matter of just trying to remember it and stuff. Sorry, Austin, go ahead. You haven't said anything so far. Yeah, no, um, I was just wondering from uh, Mr. Johnson's perspective, if like you had notes on what our attack bonuses were or if you think that would be useful to have like inside your GM screen, okay, as long as Skipper's using his uh, SCK Model 100 submachine gun, that has this attack rate, this has an attack bonus of this, and so you know right out the gate you get the edge or the bad guy gets the edge. That, I think that would really work well for a lot of people. Uh, myself, um, I know uh, Carlton built into Exploding Dice uh, for the 6th edition rules. Uh, you can actually put in, uh, for the initiative tracker that he has for that, you can put in like your current edge and your attack rating and defense rating and some stuff like that. So I could go back and refer to that. I still don't because... I've got so many different papers in front of me and mm -hmm. windows open mm -hmm. for things that I'm running. Like the time it takes me to go look that up, it's actually faster for me to ask you, hey, what's your attack rating? Um, right. Or easier for me, at least as a GM. But I think I think that technique would work really well for a lot of people. Now, having said having... that, I that I agreed a little bit with Opti about what he was saying about, you know, having to be like, oh, yeah, we forgot about that. I do want to say that I think I still... Like, regardless of whether it's the best way to do it or not, and I don't want to try to answer that question right now, um, I do I do like what they're trying to do, which is abstracting all that stuff. Um, I remember our earlier conversations on the playtest. Like, we're pretty much all like, ah, we hate this. This is garbage. And Bobby's like, no, no, I see their point. I see what they're trying yeah, to do. Yeah, Mr. Like, Johnson's talking like, about all the, along. Uh, <laughs> one of the early in iterations of this whole system was, like Mr. Johnson was saying, this chip system. And we, I was getting in, like, knockdown, drag out fights with, with everybody, uh, like, saying, no, because everybody was like, this is terrible. And I was like, no, look at what they're trying to do. It's a really good idea. Don't don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Like, it's, like, let, no, <laughs> there's something kill here. kill the baby. <laughs> kill the fraggy baby. We hate that I, baby. It really, do, it really does remind me a lot of, uh, I don't know if anyone here has played the newest edition of Warhammer Fantasy, but they have a similar thing where you gain advantage every time you make a successful attack or successful uh, skill check. I think Opti has an opinion, it sounds like. <laughs> I do, but ignore me. <laughs> <laughs> but I, but I like that concept because uh, at least with that system, every time you succeed, you get this token which you can use to get a bigger bonus, and that allows you to kind of avalanche successes in a way. And so, That's if cool. during you know a, a, a sword fight back and forth, you know you you get enough successful attacks. If you roll low, you have all this advantage built up that narratively, even if your character's out of position, you can still you know, get an extra hit on the guy or something like that. And I feel that's the edge system isn't exactly that, but that's what I find it to be most analogous to. I would like to see more of that. It, if it's going to be around, I'd like to see more of it. I, I tried to find ways that it could potentially benefit me as a supporting character, not directly attacking. Like it would have been great. Like if I had gotten four hits on a invisibility test or something like that, that's plus four to the perception that they're going to need to see um, through it, so maybe that gives me an edge or something like that, that, like, the ways you can use it more subtly when you have an opposed test like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think the way the GMs can kind of use that as a carrot to lead uh, players into doing what they want is kind of a bad way to put it, but I'm trying to think of a better phrase. But, like, for example, summoning spirits. 
you know, you get edge when you summon spirits. Um, Bobby, for Rooster, you know, you got edge whenever you had a higher attack bonus. Um, Opti got better, he got more edge when he was uh, hacking. I no, never quite got a look at that system. But to be fair, though, like, I became a, more of a summoner in order to manipulate that edge, but I yeah. was supposed to be a stealth yeah. mage. Like, I had summoning, um, but, like, that wasn't what I designed myself for, and I found myself really disadvantaged that way, so... That's a really interesting take, uh, Sarah, because what what you're saying is or what it sounds like you're saying i don't want to put words in your mouth but what it sounds like you're saying is that that because of the way edge was is works at least in relation to to magically to magicians um it sort of pushed you into a play style that you weren't necessarily wanting to play right i i wasn't a combat mage um i had one combat style that i never had to use uh i came close a couple times but then we got away um, so really the only way I could get edge is if the attack rating of my spirit was high enough, um, versus the opponent or by, by summoning. And so both of these are spirit related. So if I don't want to play a summoner or a conjurer, um, I then that leaves a, combat. I think as a GM, it's important to, to note then there's that thing in the rules, I forget how it's worded, but basically you can give an, an edge out for a player, to a player if you feel like it, because they did something cool. And I think I think uh, moving forward as a GM for 6th edition, uh, when I am aware that a character is more of a support character and has fewer opportunities to gain edge, but they're doing these cool things to kind of help, help the team in more like indirect ways and support ways, I think I would try to be more aware of handing them out edge for doing things. Yeah. Like I might just give out an edge for like, oh, you cast an invisibility spell on them, you get an edge. Yeah. Right. But if you don't, if you don't have that precedent set up with your players, though, I think that's really important too, because then it's like, well, why are you giving this person all this edge, and you don't give us edge for doing blah blah blah? So I well, think that's. Yeah, and I can answer little... that question directly, but yeah, that that's a GM discretion thing, right? Mm -hmm. right. If your GM doesn't like it, it's it doesn't think of it that way. Well. There's nothing in the book that suggests they should do that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, ultimately, you're I, left with, um, yeah, building up your edge by summoning spirits. Yeah. Right. I do. I would wonder too if in future uh, books they might put out uh, new qualities that say, okay, now that you have this quality, you get edge whenever you do this action or something like that. Is kind of a way to bridge some of those gaps. Yeah, there's already some qualities like that, just uh, not so much for the mages. Right. Like for deckers, totally. Well, not. Now, here's the thing, though. I think um, the analytical mind quality, uh, that gives you an edge uh, whenever you make a logic-based test. It doesn't say an action test or a skill test. It's a logic test. So if you're a hermetic right. mage, you should take analytical mind because anytime you roll drain, you get an edge because your logic is involved. Yeah. Yeah, I can almost guarantee that like future books would have alternate means of getting edge beyond what is in the yeah, I also especially wonder too, when, like, when the magic book comes out, like that would be a foolish thing not to just right. give a whole bunch. Of I also wonder though if there's a little bit of that intention, since in the past mages have been so overpowered, but also in the world itself, mages are supposed to be rare. So I wonder if some of that intent was like, man, if we really like nerf these mages, like maybe we less people play them and they become rare again. I don't know. Um, it still feels much bad. Of a consideration because. Um, you know, the people who become shadow runners are not like a a random sampling of meta humanity, right? Someone who's magically active, who doesn't fit into the corp world, is going to be pushed into shadow running because they have the skills and some of the abilities. So I think you're going to have a higher concentration of magicians as runners. Right. But never mind. That's just my lore speculation. So, yeah, no, I, 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 no, I, I agree with that. Yeah. I mean, and, I was yeah. speculating too. So yeah, yeah, and Sarah, even if, like, let's, I don't think that's what it was, but let's say that it was. Um, if it were, then that's just bad game design because you, it feels bad. Um, so that's why I really don't think that's what it was. Um, I think I it was think just was an oversight. There was deliberate mage nerfing yeah. in this edition, big time. <laughs> yeah, but I don't think they're saying, well, we want, you know, to make mage. To, we want to give stick it to the mages, so we're going to make it hard for them to get edge. Like I don't think that's what was going on. I, I don't, I, 
Yeah, I really don't think they're trying to discourage people from yeah. playing mages. They're but they trying were trying to, to balance it. They were trying to rein it in, I'm sure, I, I feel like. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely reining it in. Yeah. I kind of feel like they went a little bit too far in that other direction, but I, I want to play the game some more. But ultimately, I think I'm very inclined to come up with a house rule to allow you to use reagents to mitigate some of your drain and make it kind of expensive. But that's probably beyond the scope of this conversation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. But while we're on the topic of magic, I do really like the way they've changed spells where you don't have to declare a force every time and instead you have a flat, you know, extra amount of drain that you take to cast something faster or bigger or something along those lines. I agree. I was really kind of excited to uh, start getting into that, uh, some of that in our actual play uh, that Cliff runs for us. So I'm, I'm pretty excited to start playing around with that edge system for So ultimately on the edge system, I think my take on it or another observation that I have is that it takes a lot to wrap your mind around it and a lot of getting used to, to learn how to use it. Yeah, it <laughs> um, does. It's because it's so different. It I don't think that's necessarily a flaw so much as it's just so different than what we're used to seeing and it takes a while to use. I don't think it's written in a way that makes it difficult to understand for the most part. I think... I think uh, I think it seems pretty clear to me, at least. Uh, though that said, I've been like you know, reading chatter and books for a long time and kind of used to some of the uh, idiosyncrasies. <laughs> it is um, something of a paradigm shift for the system. Yeah. So, so in that sense, I um, yeah, I find it's a little bit harder to wrap your mind around. So it takes a while to get used to, but I have found that I've liked it more and more the more that I get used to it and the more that I use it and the things that I dislike about it, I find come up less and less or just don't turn out that way. Um, I do and... have to say, I, I agree. And it still feels like shatter on and it still has a good amount of crunch, but it's not overwhelmingly. So like I used to swear that I was never, ever going to GM shatter run because it was just too much for me, but um, I'm actually running first taste set Gen Con. So like, I'm finally to a point nice. where I'm like, I, I, I think I can, start to stick my toe in yeah yeah it's um it's good i think it's moving in a good direction i like i like it i'm happy it's it has done what i was hoping some some of the side effects i've seen are that in fifth edition and maybe this is just was just me and nobody else but in fifth edition i never thought too much about combat i was like there are my targets let me attack them and get them dead um, I, I, I agree. I agree. Yeah, and but now I'm in this game with the edge system has made me think a lot. Cover is I think I've said it many times over the thing, but cover is huge, and I've always thought that people didn't utilize cover as much, and cover is huge now. If you if you don't want to, those were the those were the only times when I was rolling and and shirk, like shrugging off. Or, or not taking the damage, taking damage from an attack was when I was in cover because you get extra dice, you get extra defense rating, so you're gaining edge by being in cover, but you're also rolling more dice by being in cover. So like using cover and saving a simple action or two so that you can dodge when you're attacked, like those, are, like it makes you think is my point. Like you're, you're thinking about yourself in the nope. battlefield and, and what you can no, do to gain advantage. Point. I have something of a dissenting opinion that also kind of agrees with you. <laughs> okay. Like I, I am very, I, I think of in fifth edition, very tactically, you know, taking cover is super mm -hmm. important. Those extra defense dice here and there, taking the aim axe, like, and playing with people like Carlton and uh, Josh, who are very, very uh, rules oriented and smart and clever about like just using them in, in clever, creative ways. And just both of them are really good at, at, at using the crunch uh, to their advantage. I mean, in a good way, not like rules lawyering. Um, so I think, I think there was as much tactical options in fifth as there is in sixth. I suspect that it is on a psychological level or something more enticing to acquire the edge than to bump your modifiers up or down by this or that. Yeah, yeah. 
So I think where I I suspect that might be where that's coming from, but um, just I, an idea. I one I think I one hundred percent agree with you because as you started talking, one of the things that I started to think about is is um that the difference could be a difference of cognitive load. Which what I mean by that is that in fifth edition, it was just so much to think about that I think I would just say like. I'm just not going to think about this. It's too much for me to think about. I'm not having fun thinking about this. So I'm just going to go out there and start shooting things. Like, <laughs> but now it's, it's, uh, either, either it's less to think about or it's there. It's more fun to think about it or a combination of the two. So yeah, I think it's maybe, um, yeah, more motivating. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I, I wonder because of that actually mentioning the cover and how much easier it is to think about that i've also noticed they're putting out miniatures for this edition of shadow Run, which i don't think has been done before i'm sure like if you really dug around you can well, find some ago. but i haven't i haven't Back really found in, a whole lot yeah i think in I second or third fourth edition. edition they had a few um there have been a few here and there but yeah not much i think i remember the old rel, Pal rel partha uh, mm -hmm. had some uh miniatures back in the day i remember having, having some old cyclops with a sword old pewter miniatures pinkers. of shadowrun <laughs> jason did yeah. say that if these miniatures sold well enough then maybe a second set of miniatures would be on the way and then if those did well enough then maybe maps and things like that would be which is cool <laughs> and all it's just catalyst has been so cagey or something about getting stuff done with miniatures it's like it's like they have a negative quality about like putting miniatures out or something what uh, if i don't what if i told you that it's actually not that difficult to pull off i would probably believe you because there have been so <laughs> many kickstarter funded games with tons of amazing miniatures that funded <laughs> and fulfilled well i mean many that also ripped people off and didn't right but so many that did that, yeah i i just I'm mildly astonished that that a company like Catalyst that has more clout and presumably some, you know, large amount larger amounts of funds to make use of. Like and like, like let's why just they be honest, do it. like BattleTech, like their other mainstay is a minis game. Yeah. Fair. So yeah. like this is just a weird it's a just weird don't... thing for them to say, like, let's not do it. Yeah, I just don't understand it. Yeah. Especially since they it doesn't promised. make sense to me, and people have been asking, and clamoring for it. Yeah, and like, yeah, what yeah, happened yeah. to Sprawl Gangers? Yeah, right? that, that was ages ago. <laughs> and uh, yeah. anyway, yeah. yeah. No, I wonder if with this, like we were talking about, with the making it easier to take cover and stuff, more GMs, more groups are going to play with maps because I know at least most of them that I'm aware of don't uh, for Shadowrun at least. Whereas you know, a lot more like Dungeons and Dragons groups do. I think ultimately you need maps in this edition less than the previous. Oh, it's not necessary, but I think uh, more groups would have fun with it. Oh yeah, I love having minis. That's uh, actually I play almost exclusively role-playing games sitting at my computer desk these days because everybody I play with is all around the country or whatever. So I love that, and I love playing in this format, um, and I love that I can get together with people I couldn't otherwise see. But I do kind of miss like rolling out, rolling out that uh, wet erase grid thing and plopping down the miniatures and printing out and laminating little tiles and using those. And I miss I got into it. It was painting fun. miniatures. Yeah, I That's I have fun. painted so many orcs that I didn't think I would ever miss painting miniatures. But I'm I'm starting to get the bug. Man, somebody should come out with some sort of fantasy cyberpunk gang warfare minis game. I know, right? Kind of like Necromunda, but like way cooler. Yeah, somebody should do that. Maybe some new, maybe some new fledgling company should do that. Maybe some new fledgling company has a has a uh, a rule set that can be play tested right now. If they would just ask. Oh man, something like that would be so rare. You would think of it like a like a fragging unicorn or something. <laughs> yeah, there's only some. Only some weird fragging unicorns company had a playtest <laughs> that you could actually download right now. So, oh well. But we hit we hit on magic a little bit. Um, Opti, what was it like decking compared to fifth edition? Uh, I cannot say enough good uh, about decking in this edition. 
Because even when you had to take multiple steps, like it all felt very intuitive and uh, I don't know, it was, it, was, it was very fun. There were things that you could do right away. I expect that to even get better as the addition goes on, as they sort of reach back to some of the stuff that was available in Kill Code uh, and implement that. I expect Deckers to have a really great time, especially with the edge stuff, right? I mean, I especially, I, I feel like an, uh, a decking edge would be um, something like, uh, hey, spend this many edge and you can do this right away, you know, or something like that to kind of avoid having to have uh, admin access. Or, I don't know, just, I think there's a lot of different ways you could go about it. I think that Deckers are going to be really, really fun, and uh, people are really, really going to like them. That's neat, Cliff. Yeah. yeah this, this is my weird boy. Uh, basically an orc chaos mage in 40k. One of my better paint jobs doesn't show up too well in this camera. I, I want to get into painting minis so bad, but I have a three-year-old and a six-year-old that make it really hard to do. But soon. Soon it'll happen. <laughs> <laughs> So Austin, how'd you like rigging? Uh, rigging was great. Um, I like because there's a lot less modifiers and everything. What I ended up doing, and I'm sure people saw this when I was playing, is I just made cards for all of my drones and I could easily write down um, my attack bonus for everything, uh, the different firing modes for my guns and stuff, how fast everything worked. Um, I really like a lot of that. The biggest complaint I had, though, was uh, when I was driving, the way they handle vehicle stats. You have uh, your acceleration, speed interval, and top speed, which means figuring out it, how many modifiers penalty you're taking when you're shooting out of a moving car going 70 miles an hour at someone's stationary can be very tricky to, like, it's, you have to stop and do math, and that's kind of frustrating. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I will say that I think this is the black mark on the system. This is this is an ugly bit for me. I don't like these rules. Yep. Yep. Rather specifically, I do not like the speed interval uh, rule and how that plays in and that there's no like kind of abstracted thing for car chases. Now it's like X amount of meters moving forward. Now, if you accelerate by 10 meters, then this round you move half that acceleration difference for this one. And there's, there's so many numbers and it like it just doesn't fit the aesthetic yeah, of the whole system. Else, everything else felt very streamlined and similar uh, mechanic. Yeah, You could have done something also, like that with this as well. Also, but, it just doesn't yeah. work. Like, if you look at the vehicle stats, let's pick something like a car that's designed to kind of go fast and do cool stuff. Like, um, oh no, let's just go with your truck, right? It's a GMC, yeah. or no, which one is it? It's a Toyota Gopher. Um, I'm on the drone I, sheet. That's why I'm not seeing it. <laughs> Here we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a speed interval of 15 and a top speed of 150. So anytime you exceed that speed interval, like that's dice pool modifiers against you for doing stuff. So if you're going like top speed of 150, you're looking at minus nine to your dice. And if you look at the handling, like a handling is a number like usually like four or even five. Some of them are as low as three. Uh, or even a little bit lower, but that's your threshold that you need to hit to do something cool while driving. So when you're talking like a rigger, even a rigger with a control rig with a few extra dice from that, like if you have this thing at like three quarters speed, you're going to probably crash if you have to do anything other than drive straight. And then yeah. everyone's shooting out of it is like minus eight to their stuff because you're going 50 miles an hour. Like it just, I don't like it at all. Yeah, it really I, made that first encounter with the uh, ancients very difficult. Not just like not just in terms of the combat, but also mathematically figuring out what was happening, how fast, where, how big of a penalty you're supposed to be taking. I'm extremely likely to ignore those parts of the rules and make up something else that probably looks more like the crash rules in fifth edition. But I don't know. We'll, we'll see. Maybe maybe it'll grow on me. But yeah, I I've only played it actually used it in that one scene. I just did not like how it looked. I do wonder if maybe once someone creates, you know, a little online tool where you punch in, okay, this is my thing, this is how fast I'm going, and then it'll give you all those numbers, would make that easier, which, I, it's 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 a crutch, but... That's something you expect to have to deal with in 3rd edition, though, like, not 6th, or even 5th, <laughs> well, maybe 5th, okay, if we're talking about you know, some of the complications of that, there, there's stuff you might use a track for, even then I feel like... Even if you're tracking the system well, the numbers just don't work. 
It's, yeah. it's yeah. too and high it's of penalties, difficult. too high of thresholds, and just yeah, the way it, it's too complicated, and I don't like it. <laughs> anyway, sorry, I, I don't mean to bitch about it a bunch, but yeah, no, and I, I like so much about this system. I just don't like this part. No, that's all. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree. That being said, once you ignore the speed stuff, the rest of it I like. Um, in terms of, you know, my various drones, it was very easy to get them geared up. And, uh, you know, everything was just an attack when I was jumped in using engineering plus logic. Very simple. And like I said, I could fit everything on the note cards pretty easily, which I consider a big bonus. Uh, especially when you have, you know, I have three or four different kinds of drones. But yeah, it's especially when the acceleration of speed intervals start to be weird numbers. Like looking at my crawler right now, acceleration of eight, speed interval of 10, top speed of 30. That's so much math to figure out how fast it's going when it's shooting. And You know, I feel kind of bad about something. I'm going to out myself right now. Like early on and like I think the first first session we did, like there was something that came up with the rules and like after you were like, oh, I don't like this. This is not working. And and then I was like, hey, be really careful. We're, we're presenting this to people for the first time. We don't want to be too critical. And here I am at the very end, like, bitching about the people. <laughs> which, that's so, sorry about that shit. Or opti- it's opti- right. it's so, uh, I, I feel a little bit bad about that. I didn't want to make you feel bad about it, though. I just, I just wanted to, like, hey, let's wait until we get to the end to bitch about the stuff that we don't. So. <laughs> well, so, I, but I, I feel like a hypocrite because, yeah, I told you not to not to complain, and then I just complained a bunch. <laughs> yeah, and I remember, Opti, you were complaining about the decking, and now you, you're saying that's one of the most successful parts of the system. I don't remember what I said about the decking. Does anybody? I, I yeah. honestly don't either. I don't remember what I was complaining about. Yeah. But, yeah, I ended up liking the decking quite a bit. That's really great. You might have just been butthurt that someone else took the mage. It's possible. I could have just been grumpy about it. <laughs> well, you did a really great job with your decker in the Shadowrun Origins uh, playthrough we did, too. I thought you did some really cool stuff with that five edge boost thing. Just you know, that's weak things to make those actions carry farther. I think that's that was really yeah. cool. I thought that was very memorable. We, we didn't use the five edge like thing very often, did we? I don't think we did. There was one run I was waiting for it. I had it saved up, but there wasn't a good opportunity. I was kind of hoping like someone was going to use a five edge boost in this last one to do like some cool narrative thing with the uh, the ancients mucking with the with the star there. Somehow involved them, but I was waiting for it with uh, Lone Star. If they had p- kept pursuing us, like I was about to use that exit strategy spell as a uh, lightning ball and just ramp it up and hope these guys took care of me when I passed out. <laughs> I just want to say for our newer listeners, when we refer to the five edge action, it's one of the things you can do. It's the most expensive thing. It costs five points of your edge. Create special effect. Something cool happens that helps you. A complete coincidence. You work with your GM and figure out, you know, another gang of Shadowrunners shows up and starts attacking the police, giving you cover to escape. Um, you know, something else happens on a chase scene. You know, you have the perfect chance to make a shortcut that no one can follow you past. Something along those lines. It's really cool and really cinematic, and I really like it. Yeah, and not an I win button, I don't think. Uh, I think some people are afraid that it's just going to be like, oh, blah, blah, the thing happens and we won the Shadowrun. Like, nope. <laughs> it's a. Uh... I think uh, I think when when Opti and I worked it out for the Shadowrun Origins one, your decker was was hacking someone's uh, gun to make it go off, and I'm like, that's oh, probably not going to do much. It's going to shoot up in the air. Well, I'm going to spend this five edge boost, and we work back and forth. Like you wanted to have like a whole big thing happen. Like, well, uh, we b- between the two of us, we just kind of figured out. Well, how about like if his gun goes off, but it actually happens to be he waves it around. It happens to be pointed at another ganger, and it hits them. So. Between the two of us, we came up with something that made sense. It wasn't super, like, crazy over the top. It fit narratively well with uh, the circumstances. And I think I think that's one of the keys, is just yeah, considering the narrative an, context. If you have an adversarial uh, relationship with your GM and your players, then this, this system is not going to go great for you, I think. I think but, if you guys like to work together and tell great stories and to play fun games, then it's going to be great. I almost think it doesn't matter what system you're using if you have an adversarial That's relationship true. with your DM. GM, but that said, some people do <laughs> enjoy that with like That's the hardcore D and D style play. Um, but it's not my. 
not my cup of soy calf. Yeah, Sukasa says uh, he was running beginner's box, and Decker asked him if the bike was hackable, and he said no. And the Decker said, "Is it hackable for five edge?" <laughs> yes, yes, you can. I, I like that. Yeah, I think that's, that's a great that's a one, perfect. right? Yeah. yeah. They left the wireless turned on. <laughs> you just have that. That that's a perfect example. It gives you an opening, but it doesn't give you the I win button. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's great. So I think uh, we're kind of getting to the end. We should probably wrap things up. Are I there any so. last questions from our audience or anything else we want to make sure we cover before we wander off? Or should we take some time to plug? Let's plug some direct. Um, I know we, Rem Alternis Kickstarter going on. Check that out. We'll oh, talk about that in a moment. But I want I want to hear Skipper talk about one of my favorite podcasts. I mean, Austin, because you're not playing Skipper. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, Skipper, um... tell us all about This American Life. <laughs> 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 yeah um let's see we're we've got a couple more episodes in the can we're trying to get everyone together to record the finale we're setting aside a full day i don't know if we're going to do one big final episode release or if it's going to be cut up into a bunch of smaller things that's up uh between chris and Lindsay, depending on how the beats of everything roll out and you're talking about uh, the, the the podcast crit squad so that people are aware of that's that. right crit squad i got the shirt on nice and and uh yeah so after that's done we'll do a little epilogue for everyone uh who survives and after that um milligram john is going to be coming back to uh run traveler for us which is going to be quite interesting yeah but uh yeah oh, cool this is, this is going to be the last year for uh shadow run crit squad it's i think the finale is going to be somewhere in october or november wow that's i am cool. i'm mildly depressed that that group that 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 group of characters is ending and we're not going to be following them anymore but i'm also super excited to see you guys play traveler and uh you know it's going to be the same players right Mm -hmm. and some of the ones we haven't seen for a while oh yeah absolutely and uh that's at least that's at least my philosophy is you know leave them wanting just a little bit more that way you always have that fond memory Mm -hmm. yeah yeah here i did a uh, event I do event DJing. I was at a wedding reception a couple of weeks ago, and I happened to like figure out what that the bride's favorite song was. Uh, Don't stop believing, and it's a good one. I, I I just had it ready for an encore, just in case they say one more song at the end, and I did it. And like the bride like ran up to me and hugged me, and just like, oh, my favorite song. I want. And then, like, toward the end of that, like, this other lady came, hey, play this other song, Piano Man. It'll be great. Like, hey, that's normally a great encore, but I'm leaving them on this note. (laughs) That's good. Good stuff. Yeah, that being said, too, I know everyone would be very anxious to jump right back into these characters if I had another adventure for them. So we can't rule anything out yet. Um, We'll have to see what happens down the road. Yeah. And I think you could die during character creation in Traveler. Um, There's a couple other systems as well you could do that in. Um, I remember, I think it was Dark Conspiracy by was it GDW Games. I don't think they're in business anymore. I only ever read that game book. I never actually played that game. <laughs> I made some characters, some of which died in character creation. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Twilight. Yeah. Twilight uh, 2000. That was one you could die in character creation. Also never played it, but read the books. <laughs> Yeah. Character creation is so in depth enough. I've used that as a mini game before. You just rolling up a character, you just keep rolling them until they die of old age and see their whole life story and kind of fill in the blanks when it says, you know, they start a new relationship or there's a life event, that sort of thing. And it's going to be great. We're actually going to have uh, up on our Patreon, once we make all of our characters, us actually creating all of them and making these bonds with all of our characters so that, you know, session one, the first episode, everyone's going to already be so well connected to each other. And then uh, I'm really excited to see what happens with it. Yeah. Well, uh, hey, why don't you pop a link to your Patreon in our chat stream here so people can get to that. Yeah, I'll try it out. Yep. No, Dirk, Twilight 2000 long precedes the existence of sparkling vampires. <laughs> the, only spar- the only vampires that sparkle in Twilight 20,000 uh, or 2000 are the ones that you, uh, I don't know, hit with heavy ordnance, but I'm pretty sure they don't exist because it's a somewhat realistic setting. <laughs> uh, think, uh, 
I guess command and con. No, that's the right. Yeah, command and conquer. But it's not. Never mind. It's not right. I'm babbling now. Um, I should shut up. How many of uh, uh, how many of you in the chat are going to be going to Gen Con? Because we're going to be there and we're doing several panels. If you uh, still have room in your schedule. <laughs> So. so sad I'm not going to be able to make it this year. Fingers crossed for next. Yeah. Yeah, that would be I'm, awesome. I'm definitely looking forward to getting a chance to meet you in person. <laughs> I have to say this. I'm going to take a moment to fanboy here and just say Austin is an amazing GM. I'm like just super thrilled to have a chance to GM for him. Um, honestly, I was yeah, super are, nervous about it because he's like a better GM than I am. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, no. now Austin's gonna know I, I suck. <laughs> I've been having a blast playing this, man. <laughs> Austin, yeah. Yeah, we are I, we are really so grateful to have um, both Austin and Sarah with us. So thank you guys so much. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this has been really fun. If you if you are gonna be at Gen Con, you should, and you haven't already, you should check out. Go to Gen Con to uh, their event. Um whatever you call it like the the event search thing and type in shadowcasters you'll see the events that we are going to be doing uh we're doing a panel on uh, overlay to, like stream overlay creation uh oz and myself are going to be d doing that that's on the thursday the first day of gen con then the second day friday we'll be doing two panels one on um building a a, a podcast it's called post creating a or building a podcast community but or a community around your podcast but really it's just about building a community around your content creation in general um so we're going to be talking about that damien's going to be have a lot to say there and and i'll be there and and some of the rest of us will be there um and then also friday night we'll have the Shadowcasters network um panel that we always have and um, that's just a fun chance for us to get and talk about what's going on with the Shadowcaster Network, where we're going, where the past year's been. Play. We usually play a fun game with the people on the panel, and then um, and then talk about something uh, topical or relevant to what's going on with the network at the time, or something like that. Give you guys. We like to give people a behind the scenes scenes look at how we think about things and what we're what we do and stuff like that. So. Sarah, yeah. before we before we finish, you should one last time tell everybody all about what you're doing and tell them why it's very important for them to go and help out. Awesome. So yeah, we've got a um, Kickstarter that is live. We are trying to make it to the halfway point. We're right in the middle, which is always a hard push uh, for Kickstarters. But uh, the harder we push now, the more we get now, the more likely we are, we are to succeed. So uh, if you want to see a cyberpunk fantasy TV series, uh, we are producing a trailer to show our proof of concept and uh, production quality. So you should go there, should check it out. You should uh, pledge uh, and back us if you can. Um, and whether you can or not, you should share all over Facebook and Twitter uh, and follow us. Um, because we've uh, we've got some great social goals going out as well, and um, it's a really cool project. We've got a lot of really great people, a lot of well-known writers um, and creatives in the cyberpunk fantasy community. Um, I've got Mr. J as my uh, composer as Prism Shard, and uh, Opti is one of my uh, uh, script writers and content creators. Bobby's voice is all over our videos, um, and I'm sure. He and Austin will end up helping us in some way uh, even more. So, um, yeah, we've got some really great people on our team helping us, and it's a really great project. I'll drop the link in, and I brought you guys something to show you. Oh. So, Kiri is our main character um, in the trailer. She's part of the team that'll be in the series, but um, sh I'm going to be bringing her lab coat to um, Gen Con, and it does something really cool. So I'm going to show you guys. All right. Make sure we can see it, right? Yeah. Ooh, fancy. Ooh, it's all light up. light upable um, in terms of health and um, any damage that she happens to take. Um, she's got a nice little handle so that if she falls in <laughs> a fight, she can be dragged out. <laughs> um, and we've Very got important. some cool 
little Easter eggs too. So the, the gold is actually representative of polybenzimidazole, which is as tough as Kevlar. And the uh, chemical formula on her back panel is the chemical formula for polybenzimidazole. So we got like really detailed. It's super exciting. It does cool stuff. These all independently right, light up, but I'm really bad at figuring out what the remote does. So, <laughs> uh, but yeah, she'll nice. be walking around Gen Con. So if you see me, um, come say hi. That's awesome. That's very cool. All right. And I'm looking at your Kickstarter right now. You're taking donations as low as a dollar. Yep. Yeah. So a dollar gets you um, access to our um, uh, info. You get the, the all the backer information that comes out. You get um, uh, our eternal gratitude because every little bit helps. Uh, and we go... We, we just grow from there. We have uh, a lot of really cool rewards, a lot of really cool stretch goals that I really want to hit because I want to see more content um, and learn more about these characters. Um, there's a lot of really great stuff coming, so you should definitely check it out. It's really fun. <laughs> yeah, that's Yeah, awesome. well, I know between my couch cushions and my cup holder, I've got a dollar in spare change. I can certainly donate. I've Heck actually yeah. already donated $25. But for anyone else out there who might be struggling a little bit more, yeah, even a dollar helps so, so much in something like this. Mm -hmm. It does. The more backers we have, the more it's it's a credibility boost and people want to back that. So um, also, as Opti mentioned in the chat earlier, um, all the content that you see has been produced for free. Um, these are just our creators want to see this happen. And so they've donated their time and resources to making the photo shoot come true and all the costumes and props and all the, the background videos and stuff like that. So, um, just and the music. Yeah. And the music, the music, the music has been provided pro bono so far. I'm looking yes. forward to this Kickstarter going so I can get paid to make music and say that I've been <laughs> paid for it. Heck yeah. I'm, let's make I'm not sure that's happened Shard. before. <laughs> let's make Maybe. Prism Shard a pro now. Um, <laughs> So yeah, oh, it's, hey, pro it's, is all about attitude, and I've got that. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. So yeah, it's it's super exciting, and please, if you can, um, support and share, that'd be great. Yeah. Well, thank you guys so much. Thank you everyone who's here and who's been here all along watching us play Shadowrun Sixth Edition. Um, your support and you guys hanging out with us made it all all great, and um, we loved showing it off for you guys. Oh, can I do one more thing? Yeah, absolutely. So, Rutger Hauer recently passed away. Oh, um, yeah. Which is sad. I mean, he had a pretty long life and was super awesome, like, the whole time. So, I guess, I mean, what more could anyone hope for? But it's still his passing was sad to hear. Um, he, um, so many of the movies he was in inspired me, and I'm sure many of you. Uh, he was defining for the cyberpunk genre, but also great in a lot of other stuff. I remember Escape from Sobibor, we watched in school as a... Uh, escaping from a German concentration camp film, and that mm -hmm. that that was really well done, I thought. And uh, Split Second, however, made a real strong impression on me. There's, it's this film in like a, kind of this dark cyberpunk London, with like streets are flooded and such, and and Bricker Hauer plays this hard-boiled cop, loner cop who gets saddled with this uh, kind of a pencil neck, uh, um, straight edge sort of a, a partner to help track down this serial killer. It turns out to be a big, scary monster. And when they see it for the first time, they flip out and they were like, we're going to go get bigger guns. And there's a whole segue or segue um, montage where they're going to get guns and they're talking to me, bigger guns. This one's not big enough. I need all these. Then I just I grabbed a bunch of samples from that of them talking about it. And I, a bunch of different samples from various different gun sounds to make up the drums. And then a lot of synth stuff because I love synthesizers. And I made this yeah. song called BFG. And... Um, I just uh, I've been kind of mentioning it and sharing it around because uh, it's it's some it's an art that I created that was inspired by art that Ricker Hauer created. So, and uh, I think I'm pretty proud of it. It's a cool song. Um, just want to clarify that I'm not uh, glorifying guns. It's more uh, the cool movie and the genre and the the humor of it. Sure. Yeah. Awesome. Because I in real life I, I hate guns. So that's my SoundCloud link. I just put it in the chat. Um, I have it on VHS as well, still in the cellophane. <laughs> um, um, 
So if you click on that link, there's a tons of there's a ton of music I made. You can listen to it on there, download it for free. It's all freely available, and with the exception of BFG, which technically maybe violates copyright with my use of samples, but I don't care because I give it up for free. So with the exception of that one, for that reason, it's all stuff. It's um, under Creative Commons. So if you want to use it for your projects, go for it. It's yeah, awesome. it's be great. And it's for someone else's Shadowrun game at home. Yep. Yeah. Um, a lot of my songs are kind of longer, more ambient tracks, specifically designed to be played in the background while you're playing a role playing. <laughs> yeah. So, so there's that too. But uh, BFG's uh, pretty badass too. Well, with that, um, I'm gonna say thank you and good night to everyone. And I hope to see some of you at Gen Con. And if not, um, I hope to see some of you uh, later on uh, future stuff that we do. And and uh, can't wait. For for everyone to get a hold of 6th edition Shadowrun and check it out. So, uh, yep. yeah. Thank you guys for having us too. Oh, absolutely. It was our pleasure. So, our pleasure. <laughs> Thank you and good night. Say good night everybody. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye. Good night.